We are live. Good morning. The, uh, the meeting will now come to order. Welcome to the June 30th, 2020 meeting of the uh, Durham Board of Adjustment. My name is Jacob Rogers. I am the chair of the board. I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are conducting this meeting using a remote electronic platform as permitted by session law 2020-3. The meeting will now come to order. Welcome to the June 30th. This is the second remote, or this is actually the third uh, remote meeting of the Durham Board of Adjustment and the first, uh, well, second remote BOA meeting with quasi-judicial hearings. I would ask for your patience today as we proceed. There may be slight delays as we transition between speakers. The Board of Adjustment is a quasi-judicial body that is governed by the North Carolina General Statutes and the City's Unified Development Ordinance. The board typically conducts evidentiary hearings on requests for variances, special use permits, among other requests. Today's meeting will proceed much like an in-person meeting of the BOA. On the screen, you will see members of the Board of Adjustment. Additionally, planning staff and representatives from the city and county's attorney's offices are attending in the remote meeting. Applicants, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, applicants were required to register in advance and are also attending the remote meeting. When a case is called for it, its hearing, applicants and witnesses will be promoted within the remote platform so their video can be seen. The chair will swear in applicants and witnesses at the uh, beginning of each case. Staff will present each case and applicants will then provide their evidence. Control of, of the presentation and screen sharing will remain with planning staff. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on the city's YouTube site and the link to this broadcast is on the website for the Board of Adjustment. Before we begin the evidentiary hearings on today's agenda, I would like to provide some important information about the steps taken to ensure that each party's due process rights are protected as we proceed in, in this remote platform. Each applicant on today's agenda was notified that this meeting would be conducting using a remote electronic platform. During registration, every applicant on today's agenda consented to the board conducting the evidentiary hearing using this remote platform. We will also confirm today at the start of each evidentiary hearing that the participants in the evidentiary hearing consent to the matter proceeding in this remote platform. If there is any objection to a matter proceeding in this remote platform, the case will be continued. Notice of today's meeting was provided by publishing notice in the newspaper, mailed to property owners within 600 feet of the subject properties, posting a sign at the property, and posting on the city's website. The newspaper, website, and mailed notices for today's meetings contained information how the public can access the remote meeting as the meeting occurs. These notices also contained information about the registration requirement for this meeting, along with other information about how to register. All individuals participating in today's evidentiary hearings were also required to submit a copy of any presentation, document, exhibit, or other material that they wish to submit at the evidentiary hearing prior to today's meeting. All materials that the city received from the participants in today's cases, as well as a copy of city staff's presentations and documents were posted on the BOA website as part of the agenda. No new documents will be submitted during today's meeting. No case is proceeding today in which the city has been contacted by an individual with an objection to the case or an objection to the matter being heard in this remote meeting platform. All decisions of this board are subject to appeal to the Durham Superior Court. Anyone in the audience uh, other than the applicant who wishes to receive a copy of the formal order issued by this board on a particular case must submit a written request for a copy of the order. Um, before we, uh, let's, let's go ahead and do roll. Um, Madam Clerk, would you call roll? Good morning, uh, Mr. Rogers. Here. Mr. Meadows. Here. Ms. Burnham. Mr. Davis. Ms. DeLacy. Here. Mr. Kip. Here. Mr. Retchless. Here. Ms. Jeter. 
Miss Major? Here. Miss Wymore? Here. Thank you, Susan. Um, just a couple of other housekeeping items for board members. Uh, please refrain from using the chat box. Um, if you would like to be called on, please use the raise your hand feature so you can access that at the participants tab at the bottom of your screen and then over to the right uh, bottom corner uh, is the raise hand feature. Uh, please identify yourselves uh, before you speak uh, each time. I'm going to be given the oath uh, for applicants and, and witnesses. I'll be given the oath before each case. Um, and I think that is all. Our next thing on the agenda is the approval uh, of the minutes from the June 23rd meeting. Has everyone had a chance to uh, review those? And is yes. there approved? <coughs> DeLacy? I move that we accept uh, the minutes of the prior meeting as submitted. Is there a second? Ratchlet second. Susan, would you call? Ms. DeLacy? Yes. Mr. Kipp? Yes. Mr. Meadows? Yes. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Mr. Retchless? Yes. Ms. Major? Yes. Ms. Wymore? Yes. The minutes are approved seven to zero. Righty. So the first case, um, Susan, are you ready or? Yes. Case B2000. 0010, a request for a variance from the street and rear yard setback requirements in order to construct a single family dwelling. The subject site is located at 2117 Ash Street, is zoned residential urban and in the urban tier. And this case has been advertised for the required period of time and property owners within 600 feet have been notified notarized affidavits verifying the sign postings and letter mailings are on file. Um, one thing I'll mention and I forgot to mention in the housekeeping items, uh, we're going to, would like to limit uh, or, or put a time frame with each case of 15 minutes. Um, if, if, if you, um, if for some reason we need to go beyond that, please let us know, but would like to keep to that time frame per case. Um, I need, and, and uh, Susan, can you confirm who's seated for this case? Or do we need to do that? I'll do it for each case. Um, so the seating for case B2000010 is Mr. Lacey, Mr. Kipp, Mr. Meadows, Mr. Rogers, Mitch, Mr. Retchless, Ms. Major, and Ms. Wymore. Thank you. And um, let's go ahead. Do we have our applicants video? I can, of course, I can't see it right here, but uh, to swear in. I'm here. All right. I see Eric there. All right. Well, um, um, let's see, Mr. Hedden. All right, uh, do you solemnly swear or for, affirm that your testimony and evidence shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, and do you consent to this remote meeting platform? Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, Eliza. Good morning, everyone. I'm Eliza Monroe representing the planning department. Planning staff requests that the staff report and all materials submitted at the public hearing be made, to be made part of the public record with any necessary corrections as noted. Noted. Thank you. Um, you should be able to see um, my screen in front of you. If you can't, please raise your hand and we might can figure that out, but I'm going to keep on going. Case B200010 is a request for a variance from the street and rear yard setback requirements in order to construct a single family home. I'm sorry. Okay. The applicant is Eric Hedden with Garmin Homes LLC and the subject site is located at 2117 Ash Street. The case area is highlighted in red on your screen. 
The site is within the urban tier zoned to residential urban 52 or RU52 and is within the city of Durham's jurisdiction. The site area is currently vacant. Per section 7.1.2B of the Unified Development Ordinance DDO, a 20 foot street yard setback and a 25 foot rear yard setback are required for a detached single family dwelling in the RU52 zoning district. The applicant is requesting a 10 foot variance from the street yard on the Guthrie Avenue side and a 15 foot variance from the rear yard setback in order to construct a new single family dwelling on the lot. Strict application of the ordinance will require the applicant to have a 20 foot street yard setback and a 25 foot rear yard setback. Due to it being a corner lot, it would actually have to provide two 20 foot street yards um, on either side of the lot. In addition to that, there's also a 25 foot site distance triangle, um, which is required for all corner lots to ensure driver visibility. UDO section 3.14.8 establishes the four findings that the applicant must make in order for the board to grant a variance. These findings requiring approval are identified in the staff report and the applicant's responses to the findings are identified in the application, both which are within your packets. Staff will be available to answer any questions that's needed throughout the hearing process. And to Eric, all of the documents you submitted are available here. And as, as Jacob mentioned earlier, I will be going through them to just ask me which one you would like to pull up. Uh, any questions for Eliza before we get started? Or hear from the applicant, rather? I do have a question. Mr. Kemp. What is the minimum lot size for a single family home? I, I know it's changed recently. This seems like an inordinately small lot. Yes, so the minimum lot size within the RU52 district is about 5,000 square feet. That's what the dimensional standards is kind of based upon. Um, this lot size is about 0 0.06 acres. So a little over half of that 2,700 square feet, give or take. So um, it's a pretty tiny corner lot. Um, given all of the dimensional standards from the setbacks and the site distance triangle, the buildable area is substantially significant or substantially lesser than what the neighbors might be experiencing. Any other questions for Eliza? All right. Another question. Am I correct that if this house were to be built and then burned down, it couldn't be rebuilt because the lot is less than a tenth of an acre? Or is that not the case? Um, you, I'm sorry, you kind of went a little bit there in the beginning. Um, it might be my connection. Would you mind repeating the beginning of the question? Sure. If this, if this house were built and then burnt down to the ground, it couldn't be built back as of right. Am I correct? If that scenario was to occur, then they would have to come back before when the board to receive the It couldn't be rebuilt because the lot is less than a tenth of an acre. Or is that not the case? Uh, I think we're getting feedback. Yeah, I'm getting an echo. Sorry. An echo, rather. I'm hearing an echo as well. Um, I'm just going to mute everyone Dockery. very quickly. That's Eliza, this is Jessica Dockery, Planning Department. If there was a building on the site that had been approved and they rebuilt within the same footprint within a set time frame. they could reconstruct this building. There are provisions for that in the UDO. The question, um, uh, let's see here. Were there other approvals that this developer had to go through? Because um, again, this lot is tiny. There's so, not a planning department again. Sorry to interrupt, Eliza. To be clear, if it's a lot of record, then they there are also are provisions in the UDO to allow single family development on that lot of record. Je Eliza Monroe, planning department, wanting to reiterate what Jessica said, Mr. Kip, within section 14, um, any lot of record that's a minimum, I think, of 35 foot wide can um, be developed for single family development. However, if they can't meet the provisions that's throughout the rest of the UDO, they have to get a variance, which is how we're here today. Um, and in terms of the lot size, once Jessica, as Jessica mentioned before, the lot of record kind of allows it to still be developed as long as it's meeting that 35 foot width. Okay. I saw Mr. Meadows had his hand raised as well. Um, so I'm gonna lower his hand. Mr. Meadows. 
Thank you. Um, I have a quick question about the driveway. It looks like the driveway is going to be accessing the, the site from Harvard Avenue. Um, it looks like the current curb cut for the driveway is, is, is back at on Guthrie. Um, is this something that you guys look at as part of this process? Uh, Eliza, ha, ha, is there any consideration given to the, the driveway location that has proposed? Um, I, so the driveway access is off of Ash Street. So um, the Harvard Avenue kind of threw me there a little bit. Um, but uh, the driveway location was considered in terms of that it's an ash facing block face. So the driveway was given to that site um, or to that uh, facade of the lot. Um, other than that, there has not been any specific review of the driveway in terms of width and things of that sort, as that will be during the building permit process. Mr. Kipp's earlier question about whether or not there's been any other reviews, there hasn't. The applicant has solely gone through this process first to see if they will see um, receive any variances to allow for the home to be where they would like it to be, and then from there we'll have to go through other review processes. Any other questions for Eliza before we continue? All right, Mr. Hedden. Hey, good morning. Can everybody hear me okay? You're you're kind of muffled. Um, and I'm not sure for everybody else, but it is for me. I'll just get closer. <laughs> Any better now? No, not really. You're pretty muffled. Sorry, I don't know what's wrong with my computer, but uh, you know, I'm gonna make an attempt here to do my best with what we've got. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you for um, allowing me to speak this morning uh, on behalf of Garmin Homes uh, and Durham Building Company. Durham Building Company is actually gonna be purchasing the lot from Garmin Homes and uh, we'll be in charge of constructing the single family house. Um, I wanted to, uh, based off of uh, kind of what Ian had been, um, uh, based off his question or his remark about it being a smaller lot, uh, it, it is an extremely small lot. Um, I brought uh, in the packet towards the end, um, I wanted to kind of put some context into um, kind of the, the local neighborhood or uh, basically, I did a two block radius analysis on other lots in this neighborhood. Um, and yeah, it's there's only five other lots that are smaller than ours. Um, a couple of them do have houses on them. And uh, I think there are a couple vacant ones, but the ones that are uh, that have a house on them all violate what would be considered current city ordinances by uh, um, in some shape or form, whether it be a front or a side or both uh, setbacks. Um, you know, granted, when those houses were built, I'm sure they were fine, but as time moves on, the ordinances uh, got stricter due to technology and, and just uh, how we go about our lives each day. Um, but, uh, I just wanted to bring up the fact that we specific, we tried for several years to try and figure out a, the best way, um, to do something with this lot. And, uh, we specifically designed this floor plan for this lot. Um, and whenever we do design a, uh, a house, we, we take into the, to consideration the, uh, the surrounding areas and, and doing something that we feel is going to uh, fit in well with the neighborhood, um, especially just the, the street faces that this property would uh, be near. Um, we actually have a lot of Durham building company houses in the, in the uh, near vicinity. Uh, we have three across the street uh, to 2110, 2112, and 2114 that we built a couple of years ago. And we're also building a house kitty corner to this lot. 
currently right now. It's the address is uh, the official address is 221 South Guthrie, but it's it's kind of that peninsula shaped lot that you know, splits Harvard, Ash Street, and Guthrie. Um, yeah, there we go. I think on that view right there, uh, it was 2202 Harvard, but it's been since recombined into two lots, and we have that little that little uh, triangular shaped lot. Uh, kind of where that dot is. Um, and then you can see across the street, uh, 21, 10, 12, and 14 are houses that we've built uh, in prior years. Um, so it, it's definitely going to fit in with our current product. We, uh, I, I design all of our, our plans and floor plans, and I did a lot of research on this with the local real real estate community to see if this was a viable um, uh, plan that could, somebody could actually uh, see as, as being their home. Um, it is a little bit smaller than normal, but uh, you know, given the size of the lot, it we I think we tried we tried our best to get something that's going to um, work well with the lot. It's a two bedroom house. We normally do nothing smaller than three, but um, given the lot limits, we, uh, we settled for two, two bedrooms. So I, we kind of see this as a, as maybe a roommate type house. Um, and we definitely had to go two stories just because of the limitations of the footprint. Um, anything that would be a single story would almost be, uh, not usable, maybe a, a large dog house or something. <laughs> but, uh, um, we did find a way to, I think if you, Clyde, if there's a way you can go back to the second plot plan, I think you, yeah, there we go. Oh, it's the one after that. Yeah, there we go. So we were able to uh, come up with the, the least disruption, I guess, to the ordinance that we could find um, by orienting the house facing um, Ash Street. Um, where we would be violating just the rear yard setback. Um, the rear yard setback in this situation is 10.7 feet where we need to be 25. Uh, the left yard setback, we're within uh, ordinance standards of 7.6 and the minimum is 6. The front, we are achieving the 20 foot front yard setback standard. And then the right side, we use the uh, the minimum. So if you look at the lower right, there's a table, the top table shows the addresses of all the houses on the block face of South Guthrie. And uh, 202 is 10 feet away from the property line in the front. So we use that as the minimum to set our house away from that, that, uh, that property line. The Guthrie side property line. So, in essence, we're only violating or asking variance to violate one one setback, which is the rear yard. Um, and then also, I wanted to bring to attention that we did try to um, kind of uh, design both the Guthrie facing and the Ash Street facing side of the house to almost have two different fronts um, so that, you know, one side wasn't looking at, you know, just a bare plain uh, facade of the, of, the, of the structure. So um, you can see it almost looks like the house has two different fronts just to kind of have a nicer uh, view from the, the street. And that's pretty much my, uh, my presentation. Uh, Mr. Hedden, would you like your testimony and documents uh, to be part of the public record? Say again, please. Uh, would, you, would you like all of your testimony and the documents submitted to be part of the public, public record? Yes. OK, thank you. All right, I, any questions for, for the applicant? Mr. Meadows. Mr. Meadows has his raised hand. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I am looking at the, um, 
it's the I guess the second elevation and I'm sorry I'm just a little bit confused about the orientation of the house it looks like there is um thank you Eliza would you go back one one more one more I guess I guess farther back into the closer to the front of the of your slide deck sure thing um that one right there Back. This one here? Nope. Next one? This one. That one. I believe okay. that that is the orientation of the house. However, there's a sort of a parallelogram that looks like it's been hand drawn in pen. I guess the question is, is this the footprint of the house? Um, and, and this other, the, the darker hand drawn line is just extraneous? That, that's my question. Yeah, I think that I have a I don't know how that older version got sent, but I have a, uh, a more current version of it, which is basically the same thing without that hand-drawn thing, parallelogram. But I think that parallelogram was basically, if I were to follow the ordinance per the law, that would be our building envelope. I see. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Hedden? Mr. Rochelis has his hand raised. Okay, Mike. Hi, Mr. Hedden. Did you, uh, being this is, uh, you agree that this is over 3,000 square foot house? Uh, no. Well, you got 1,566 square foot footprint. Is that correct? We only have a 950 square foot footprint. There might be a mistake. Total square footage of the house is 1159. The first floor is 614, but I think that 950 includes the front porch. Mm, I'm looking at page. 17 and I'm reading is that 1566 total square feet of the house uh, no I don't think so that's uh, what, what do we have here then uh, that you have written um, it would be page 17 of the packet um, Mr. Retros, I don't mind pulling it up for you would you mind um the pages kind of change a little bit is it one of the um, floor plan drawings i don't it's the property um it's right before his analysis that's a different address is it it's okay. a 215 south driver street i'm sorry my, my mistake on that but what is the total square footage of the house is what i'm trying to get to uh, 1159 please. 1159. Thank you. And did you do any analysis of what the average square footage of houses around that area? Not, not the square footage of houses, no. Um, no, I did not. I did not. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Hedden? Mr. Hedden, so I'm, I'm, I'm uh, just wanting to, to understand the burden here. The burden seems to be, and from what I can gather from what you're saying, is that the, uh, uh, the lot is too small to conform with these, and, and, you, and you've redesigned a house to, to fit in this lot, even though it still encroaches these setbacks. Yeah, the, the, my 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 goal for this was to be respectful of the of the area as far as size and giving a, a, a viable surrounding on the lot from the house. Um, 
you know, we didn't want to be greedy and just, okay, we're going to build a 2000 square foot house and use up every inch of the lot. Um, we tried to uh, kind of fit, find the best of both worlds, find a, a reasonably marketable house that'll fit into the neighborhood while at the same time disrupting the least amount of setback, ordinance setback as possible. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Wymore has her hand raised. Who does? Wymore. Oh, Ms. Wymore. Just very quickly, Mr. Hedden. Um, this is a, a spec house, correct? You don't have a buyer for this house. It's just you're building it. Correct. Okay. All right, any more questions or thoughts? All righty. Uh, can we staff it or, or mute every, um, there's an echo. Okay, um, all right, well, let's bring this back to the table. Any thoughts or discussions for board members or from board members? All right, no thoughts. Uh, this is a variant, so we're not getting a uh, recommendation from staff. Uh, would anybody like to make a motion? <coughs> Meadows, I will. Thank you. Uh, I hereby make a motion that application B2000010 an application for a request for a variance from the street and rear yard setback requirements and property located at 2117 Ash Street has successfully met the applicable requirements of the Unified Development Ordinance and is hereby granted subject to the following conditions. The improvements shall be substantially consistent with the plans and all information submitted to the board as part of the application. Yeah, Lacey, second. Okay. We've got a motion and a second. Um, Susan, would you call the board? Mr. Ratchless? Mr. Mike, Ratchless. You're muted. You're still muted. Mr. Ratchless? Yes. Miss yes. <laughs> Major? Yes. Miss Wymore? Yes. Ms. DeLacy? Yes. Mr. Kipp? Yes. Mr. Meadows? Yes. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Motion carries seven to zero. A uh, vote of seven to zero. Your variance has been approved. Uh, you'll receive an order shortly and uh, appreciate you coming this morning. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you like to call the second case? Case B2000011. A request for a variance from the rear yard setback requirement in order to construct a single family dwelling. The subject site is located at 1005 Rock Street, is zoned residential urban and in the urban tier. And this case has been advertised for the required period of time. Property owners within 600 feet have been notified and the notarized affidavits verifying the sign postings and letter mailings are on file. Uh, Susan, who's seated? Uh, I guess we'll I'm sorry, the seating for this case, B2000011, is Ms. DeLacy, Mr. Kip, Mr. Meadows, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Retchless, Ms. Major, and Ms. All right, so uh, we'll swear in the applicants at this time, witnesses for this case. Are, are they ready? I, I can't see them. Mr. Smith, you'll have to turn on your video in order to be sworn in. Oh, I see you now. Thank you. Okay, and so ready. 
All right, Mr. Smith, do you solemnly swear or affirm that your testimony and evidence shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. All right, and do you consent to this remote meeting format? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Eliza, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Eliza Monroe, representing the planning department. Planning staff requests that the staff report and all materials submitted at the public hearing to be made part of the public record with any necessary corrections as noted. So noted. Thank you. Case B200011 is a request for a variance from the rear yard setback requirement in order to construct a single family dwelling. The applicant and property owner is Jason Smith. The subject site is located at 1005 Rock Street. The case area is highlighted in red on your screen. Um, the site is in the urban tier, zoomed residential urban 52, and is within the city of Durham's jurisdiction. The site is currently vacant. The site area is currently vacant. Per section 7.1.2b of the Unified Development Ordinance, a 25 foot rear yard setback is required for a detached single family dwelling in the RU52 zoning district. The applicant is requesting a 10 foot variance from this rear yard in order to construct a new single family dwelling on the lot. The strict application of the ordinance would require the applicant to have a 25 foot rear yard setback. The lot is less than 50 feet deep, meaning that a 25 foot rear yard would encompass over half of the lot. The applicant is, um, staff would also like to point out that in regards to the street yard, because that is something that it does, if you look, it might seem that the um, house is a little bit closer to the street yard than normal. Um, the lot is located within the urban tier, so it must meet the infill development standards within section 6.8.2a.2 of the Unified Development Ordinance. This standard does allow the applicant to have a street yard within the range of any distance between the smallest and largest street yards within the context area. So that would be other homes along Block Rock Street. Um, the, there is a couple of homes, a couple doors down that are relatively close, like right off the sidewalk. Um, so the applicant is able to be within that range. However, in no instance shall the smallest street yard be less than five feet. Um, so the applicant has chosen to also have the same street yard as those two neighbors that are a little bit down the road. UDO section 3.14.8 establishes the four findings that an applicant must make in order for the board to grant a variance. These findings requiring approval are identified in the staff report and the applicant's responses to the findings are identified in the application, both of which are within your packets. Um, staff is available for any questions as needed throughout the hearing process. And um, Jason, if you have any um, documents you'd like me to bring up, you won't have access to the screen. So please let me know and I can bring things up as they come. Okay. Any questions for Eliza? All righty, um, Mr. Smith. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks for your time. So I am not a builder in LLC. This is a home that I would build for myself and my family. I've had the lot for several years now and I've just finally got around to wanting to actually pursue and build this single family home on it. Um, like Eliza said, pretty much what I want to do is just decrease the rear yard setback. Um, everything else will still meet the current city requirements. Um, my lot's a little unique. Uh, Eliza, do you mind going back to that aerial of the lot that showed like the topography? From, from, yes. So what's unique to this lot is this house had a single family home, a huge single family home ranch that was on it for decades, but it's been gone for a half a, half a century. So if you look closely, you can see there's a car parked currently. Yeah, so there's already a curb cut there. There's already a water meter on the lot. So this house was, there was a house functioning on this parcel lot way back when. And there's even a sidewalk still where the front porch would have tied into. You can see that little white square. So all I'm trying to do now is rebuild a new house on where there was a house many, many decades ago. Um, excuse me? I don't think there's anybody talking. Oh, um, yeah, so every, the infrastructure's already been here. So it's been a developed lot in the past. 
Um, and so I'm just wanting to redevelop it uh, for a house for me and my family. And we just need to decrease the rear yard setback. Um, if you go, Liza, can you go to the, either the picture up or down that showed all parcels around that didn't show, uh, doesn't show the actual houses? Yes. So if you look down to the right on Carroll Street, if you look at the very bottom right, 1013 Carroll and 1015 Carroll, they're pretty much identical size lots. Um, 1015 Carroll was built in 06 by the Habitat for Humanity. Um, what you can't see on this screen is there's two properties further up on Carroll up in the 900 block or the 700 block that are the exact same size that were built in 2016, um, ranging from 1800 to 2300 square foot as well. So there's lots all around that are this similar size of around 0.07 acres that have had new construction on them within the last few years as well. Mr. Smith, uh, would you like your testimony and all these doc in your documents submitted to be part of the public record? Yes. Thank you. Forgot to do that earlier. Oh, no problem. All right. Any questions for the applicant, Mr. Smith? Um, Mr. Rutschless raised his hand, and before he gets started, I would like to make a correction in my re previous speech. The variance request is for a 14-foot variance, not a 10-foot variance, so I would like to clarify that on the record, and I will now turn the floor over to Mr. Rutschless, who has his hand raised. Hi, Jason. Uh, can you explain what picture one, two, and three are again? Um, sure, Eliza, if you'll go... Oh, this just speaks to what Eliza was talking about, about the required, I don't have to meet, I don't have to request a variance for the street yard because of my block face having other existing structures that are literally, this doesn't even meet the five foot setback that's currently required. So I'm just gonna meet the minimum required. So you can see, yeah, there's the block face going up towards my lot. So you can see there's this home and another home that literally sit pretty much on the right of way. And so I'm actually gonna have the house start five foot further back and then the, that's for the front porch and then the actual house will be another five foot back. That's the lot itself. And so I just wanted to give you, you can see the sidewalk there where there used to be, I assume that was the front porch where you went into the house and the shadowing to the right is where the driveway curb cut is and the water meter. So what I'm wanting to do here is just show that I'm requesting this rear yard variance. And so by decreasing my rear yard, if we go back to picture three, Eliza, that'd be great. If you don't mind. Um, behind there is nothing but woods and trees. There's no encroachment on another property or structure. I mean, on any structure or anyone else. So it literally would not affect decreasing that that amount of feet would not encroach on anyone else. It's just nature behind it. Um, and so that just gave this picture sort of as the, what the lot looks like and how it, you can see it's sort of been developed in the past. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Uh, Mr. Smith, what, what, just for uh, how, many, how many square feet are you looking at here? It's going to be just under 2,000, so about 1950. Not, the, the footprint's going to be about 980 uh, square foot of building footprint. And it's going to be a two-story home. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Smith? All right. Any uh, thoughts or discussion uh, of board members? Okay, uh, is there a motion? Delacy, I'm sorry, before we uh, make a motion, um, where there is uh, that uh, piece of sidewalk, will the applicant be required to uh, put a sidewalk right up against the curb? Uh, how And how deep is the right of way? I'm sorry, I should have asked that earlier. Eliza? Sorry, um, I'm muting myself. They will not be required to put up a sidewalk there. 
Um, as we've kind of alleviated to the sidewalk that's along there. here. I'm sorry, I hear some feedback. So I'm just gonna mute everybody so I can make sure I can, um, there's no echoes, um, but they will not be required to put in a sidewalk. Um, and then the question I believe you had about the right of way. Um, I believe the right of way, it's not on the survey that's provided, but I believe right of way is a 50 foot right of way, um, which is typical in this area for the street size. Did you say five zero feet or one five? How many feet is the setback? I, I heard, this, I didn't hear. Are, were you asking about the setback or the right of way? I'm sorry, the right of way. Gotcha. <laughs> sorry. Um, it's not on the survey, so I cannot give an exact number, um, the survey that was provided, but I will say it's usually typically a 50 foot right of way in these areas. I'm not sure. Did you say five number. zero? Five zero. Fifty. Sorry. From the I'm center of the street? <laughs> From the center of the street? All the way around, all the way from one side to the other. That's a typical size, but it's not provided here. So I can't give okay. you the exact number. I'm just giving you an average range. Um, if any other staff member wants to provide input, but. I, my... uh, Regina, you, you muted. Still sorry. Yes. I'm sorry. My you question went... is, would the house be built in the right of way or like, so if, if fiber cable wants to come, they tear down his porch, or will is his house safely outside the right-of-way? That's correct. The house is safely outside the right-of-way and is meeting the street yard setback as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, the survey, uh, the five-foot setback is five foot from the right-of-way, so yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? I have a question. Ms. Major. So I want to make sure I understand it first. Um, so you're requesting a variance for the back part of the lot, right? Yes, the rear yard, that's correct. Okay. And so you said that the house was going to be approximately 2,000 square feet? Yes. So you could build a smaller house and be in compliance? No. Can you explain that? Because I would still need the variance. I, there's not a footprint that can make me allow to be able to be a, build a house and have the depth needed. The house, to have a 25 foot yard setback and a five foot front yard setback would leave me 18 foot of depth to build a house on. Okay, so it's gonna be a wide house. It's, the lot is 11 foot wider than it is long. So I'm using a, it's just a few foot wider. It's more like a slight variation of a square. It's a little bit wider than it is deep. deep. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Would someone like to make a motion? I'll do it. This is Meadows. Um, I hereby make a motion that application number B2000011, an application for a request for a variance from the rear yard setback requirements on property located at 1005 Rock Street, has successfully met the applicable requirements of the Unified Development Ordinance and is, here, and is hereby granted. Subject to the following conditions, the improvements shall be substantially consistent with the plans and all information submitted to the board as part of the application. We've got a motion. Is there a second? Why more second? Why more? Uh, Susan, will you call the board? Mr. Lacey? Yes. Mr. Kipp? Yes. Sorry, yes. Mr. Meadows? Yes. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Mr. Retchless? Yes. Ms. Major? Yes. Ms. Wymore? Yes. Motion carries seven to zero. By a vote of seven to zero, your variance has been approved. Um, thank you for coming to the BOA this morning. Thank you very much. Do you guys just send something out after the meeting or something or? Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank y'all very much. 
Have a good day. Uh, Susan, would you like to call the next case? Case two, bit case B2000013, a request for variances from the project boundary buffer along the right of way. The project boundary buffer between two zoning districts and the tree coverage requirements for the demolition and reconstruction of a restaurant. The subject site is located at 4301 North Roxburgh Street. Is split zoned commercial general and commercial neighborhood and in the falls of the noose Jordan Lake protected area, watershed protection overlay and in the suburban tier. This case has been advertised for the required period of time and property owners within 600 feet have been notified. Notarized affidavits verifying the sign postings and letter mailings are on file and the seating for this case B2000013 is Mr. Lacey, Mr. Kip, Mr. Meadows, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Retchless, Miss Major and Miss Wymore. All righty. Um, I think I just saw that. We've got the applicants on here. Um, do the swearing in now. Um, Mr. Biker, are you representing the applicant on this one? Yes, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Brian Saltz will be our other witness. Okay. Uh, well, let's go ahead. Raise your right hand, if you will. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that your testimony and evidence shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank I do. you. Uh, and do you consent to this remote meeting format? Yes, sir. All right. Yes. Uh, Eliza. Before we get started, Mr. Van Buren, are you speaking on behalf of the applicant or from the members of the public? I'm going to unmute you so you can respond. Um, hold on, Mr. Van Buren. You're, okay, I'm sorry, I tried to unmute. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can hear you. I, I am present, but will not be speaking. I'll allow Brian Soltz and Patrick Biker to speak for McDonald's, um, but I do work for McDonald's Corporation and will be present during the meeting. Thank you. Okay, gotcha. Just wanted to make sure we didn't need to rope you in there. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Um, Eliza Monroe with the planning department. The planning staff does request that the staff report and all materials submitted at the plan public hearing to be made part of the public record with any necessary corrections as noted. So noted. Thank you so much, Chair. Case B2000013 is a request for variances from the project boundary buffers along the right of way. The project boundary buffer between two zoning districts and the tree coverage requirements for the demolition and reconstruction of a restaurant. The applicant is commercial site design. The subject site is located at 4301 North Roxborough Street. The case area is highlighted in red on the screen. The site is within the suburban tier. It is split zoned both commercial general as well as commercial neighborhood. It's within the Falls of Noose Jordan Lake Protected Area Watershed Protection Overlay District and is within the city of Durham's jurisdiction. The site area does currently have a McDonald's restaurant there. Um, McDonald's is going to be the current use as well as the proposed use. Um, once reconstructed, it will be once again at McDonald's. So it's not a change of use or business. I'm gonna go past this a little bit. These are forms from the applicant. So Morningstar Law Group, an agent for the applicant, request variances from the project boundary buffer along the right of way, the project boundary buffer between the two zoning districts and from the tree coverage requirements um, of the zoning district on the site located at 4301 North Roxborough Street. Per section 9.4.2A2 of the Unified Development Ordinance, a project boundary buffer is required along rights of way that are less than or equal to 60 feet in width. And I'm going to scroll a little bit. I don't want to give anyone a headache just to the site plan so I can have that on the screen. The applicant is proposing to demolish the existing McDonald's and replace it with a completely new building. Um, there is currently not a project boundary buffer located along the Roxborough Street right of way, which is um, shown here at being exactly 60 feet. Um, so it doesn't necessarily um, 
it's not meeting that requirement and thus is required to have a project boundary buffer. A UDO section 9.4.3b requires a 30 foot 0.6 opacity buffer between the CG and CN zoning districts and a 20 foot wide 0, um, 0.4 opacity buffer between the CG and CG zoning districts to kind of give some context. The site is split zones, so you've got a mixture of CN and CG pretty much down the middle where the building's located. And then you've got CG to CG up here where there's this small sliver of a parcel. I'm gonna use the annotate function on purple, which is my favorite color to kind of specify where I'm referring to up there. Um, so that being said, there um, is uh, the applicants requesting a variance from those um, requirements um, in order to uh, still have the adequate space needed for a waste facility in that corner of the site. Um, instead of providing a 20 foot buffer, they're instead of providing a 10 foot 0.2 opacity buffer. So about half of the requirements. Lastly, UDO section 8.3.1E.1 requires that for parcels that are greater than one acre, no tree replacement area shall be counted towards the, toward meeting the tree coverage standard unless it includes a minimum 1,000 square feet and has um, no individual dimension of less than 25 square feet. Um, that is a lot of words to essentially state that due to the lot size of being slightly over acre, it's like 1.042, um, they have a certain amount of tree replacement requirements. Redevelopment of the restaurant will require the installation of sidewalks along Roxborough Street, um, as well as um, the removal of those existing street trees along those areas. So therefore they can't um, keep those trees for credit for tree coverage. Per UDO section 8.3.1C.4A.2, um, when there is less than 6% of preserved street coverage area, the applicant is required to provide at least 15% total tree coverage area. Um, that 15% requirement is a little bit difficult to be met on this site. Once again, it's just over an acre, um, like 1.08 um, acres. Um, and in order to meet that requirement, the applicant would more than likely have to sacrifice some other dimensional um, or some other uh, attributes they're wanting to put in here, like the installation of sidewalk, the potential drive-through stacking, um, as well as the parking requirements. So tons of information and variances, which staff will definitely be available for any questions as well as the team from the applicants. Um, UDO section 3.14.8 establishes four findings that the applicant must make in order for the board to grant a variance. These findings required approval are identified in the staff report and the applicant's responses to these findings are identified in the application, both of which are within your packet and staff will be available for any questions that's needed during the hearing process. I do have the staff report um, documents available, which will include um, the site plan, um, which is here, as well as the exhibits that the applicant submitted and were available online beforehand. And I do see Mr. Meadows has his hand raised. Uh, Chair Rogers, turning it over to you, sorry. Go, go ahead, Mr. Meadows. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Eliza. Um, I have two questions. Uh, question number one, um, how th this site is developed now, uh, it's going to, it's a McDonald's now, it'll be a McDonald's in the future maybe. Um, how many parking spaces are uh, on the site now and how many are proposed uh, with the redevelopment? Yep, so we're gonna go back to the, oops, sorry. Um, back to the first page here, and I probably should have blown this up a little bit better, um, but the existing parking, so oh, sorry, um, everyone, I might have to exit out of this in order to zoom in so I can see it because I am doing an interesting conglomerate of screens right now in order to be able to see. Here we are. I apologize for anyone who gets a headache from sudden screen movement. Going upward, upward, downward, downward. Sorry, what's it? Oh, 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 oh. So, there are 51 existing parking spaces. Um, the requirement here is based upon the square footage of the inside. Um, so, the ending is going to have about 45 total parking spaces. Um, and with that, there will be, of course, the one regular um, handicap parking, ADA accessible space, and a van accessible space as well. So they have 51 and they're going to 45, so they're reducing the number of parking spaces. That's correct. There will be a reduction in impervious surface, um, mm -hmm. which okay. is further down there as well. 
one more question for you, please. Um, do what is the uh, total length of a forty-five degree parking stall and a one-way uh, travel island? I am pulling up the UDA for that. So you're wondering what the requirement is for the length of a forty-five degree parking space. I, yeah, I, I think those are 40. I, I'm sorry, 60 degree. I apologize. Uh, 60 degree parking space and a one way, um, one way aisle. Jessica Dockery, Planning Department. Mr. Meadows, the length of the parking space doesn't change. The width of the travel lane does. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> or do you need it to know the travel lane width or the length of the parking space? I'm more interested in the travel lane width. Okay. The traveling width would be 18 feet is required by UDO section 10.4.2A. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Eliza or staff? All right, Mr. Biker, we're turning it over to you. And would you like your testimony and the documents submitted to be part of the public record? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. It's all yours. Good morning, Chairman Rogers, members of the board. My name is Patrick Biker with Morningstar Law Group. Our office address is 112 West Main Street, second floor here in Durham. I'm here today representing McDonald's. At this time, Mr. Chairman Rogers, we'd also like to have uh, my resume and the resume for Brian Soltz, our site engineer, uh, be entered into evidence as exhibits A and B, uh, documenting that we are duly qualified experts to testify before the board this morning. Also want to introduce exhibit C, which is a graphic uh, we sent into Eliza a few days ago. That's a graphic that Mr. Soltz prepared uh, based on the site plan, and that will help to illustrate our testimony this morning. Uh, exhibit A lists my experience and qualifications that I'll go through very briefly. Uh, I have a law degree and a master's in city and regional planning from the University of North Carolina. I've been working uh, in as a real estate lawyer and uh, development in the area of real estate development for approximately 25 years. I also have the certification of a, a lead AP, which is a leadership in energy and environmental design. My role on this team has been to uh, prepare the variance application uh, that we submitted to the planning department on behalf of McDonald's. And in preparing to testify this morning, I reviewed all the submitted materials, including the site plan, the staff report, and all the attachments for the redevelopment of this McDonald's located at 4301 North Roxborough Street in Durham. Mr. Chairman and members of the board, I will address, address finding number one, and then I'll turn it over to Brian Soltz to address findings number two and three. And then I will conclude our presentation by addressing finding number four. I'd like to have exhibit C up on the screen for your review during our testimony. Thank you, Eliza. Uh, we seek a variance uh, on behalf of McDonald's to construct a new restaurant after demolition of the existing McDonald's. The current McDonald's was built back in 1975. Due to changes in the applicable ordinances over the past 45 years, it's not possible to provide the minimum required parking and also meet project boundary buffer and tree coverage requirements now required in the UDO. Now I'd like to address finding number one. That is, unnecessary hardship would result from the strict application of the ordinance. It's not necessary to demonstrate that in the absence of a variance, no reasonable use can be made of the property. Strict application of the UDO with respect to the project boundary buffers and tree coverage percentage and related dimensional standards results in an unnecessary hardship for 1.08 acre site that's barely able to meet the required parking. It's also very difficult to meet the drive-through stacking, but that is on the site plan before you today. As I mentioned earlier, the existing McDonald's was built in 1975, and this section of Durham has been urbanized for many decades. The restaurant that we're talking about here, the McDonald's, is surrounded by other restaurants, a convenience store with fuel sales, and a tire shop, as well as wide rights of way associated with US highways. A key factor driving this variance request is that McDonald's property is split zoned between CG and CN, and the zoning district essentially goes right through the middle of the existing building. Properties along the western border of this site are all zoned CN. Strict application of UDO section 9.4.3 requires a 0.6 opacity or a 30 foot wide project boundary buffer between the CN, CG and CN zoning districts, and a 0.4 opacity, a 25 foot 25 foot wide buffer between the CG and CG zoning districts, uh, which would be the Wendy's to the north. 
If the property had been zoned CN in its entirety, no project boundary buffer along the western edge of the property would be required. In fact, no project boundary buffer is required along most of the western edge because the property is split zone. Only a small portion of the northwest uh, corner of the property requires this extensive project boundary buffer. On the north side, as Eliza mentioned, there's a small intervening parcel that causes the strict application of the UDO to impose a full 20 foot buffer, despite half the buffer being provided on the windy site to the north. Meaning the full extent of both, buffer, of both buffers, that's hard to say, would reduce the amount of on-site parking below the required minimum, which is an unnecessary hardship. Under these circumstances, the 10 foot 0.02 opacity buffer we have shown on the site plan is a reasonable measure to be taken to address this situation. The same logic applies to the project boundary buffer along North Roxboro Street. The dedicated right of way for North Roxboro is 60 feet wide. If the right of way were any larger, a project boundary buffer would not be required. So if it were 61 feet, we wouldn't be having this conversation. It's important to note that the Wendy's just to the north of this property was not required to provide a project boundary buffer along North Roxboro when it was redeveloped despite the UDO requirement for such a buffer. Therefore, not only would strict application of the UDO prevent the proper amount of on-site parking from being provided, it also would create a mismatch of landscaping treatment along North Roxboro Street. Finally, on-site parking and street visibility are factors that are important for the success of this longtime Durham business, which is owned by a longtime Durham family. Strict application of the UDO would cut against both these factors and that's an unnecessary hardship. UDO section 8.3.1 requires varying degrees of tree coverage based on the preserve, percentage of trees preserved on site. The redevelopment of the existing McDonald's will require sidewalks to be, be installed. While new sidewalks along Horton Road and North Roxboro Street will be a great benefit to the community, their installation does require removal of all the trees along those two streets. Based on the limited existing tree coverage, Removal of those trees forces this project into the highest tree coverage bracket in the UDO, which is 15%. 15% of this small site turns out to be 7,045 square feet. The proposed redevelopment of this site actually reduces impervious surface on site by 3,372 square feet, or 9% of the site, also reduces the access points from four to two, and also the building square footage is being reduced by 152 square feet. Even so, the 15% tree coverage and dimensional standards for tree coverage cannot physically be met on this site without compromising the UDO required minimum parking and the minimum drive-through stacking. We do want to draw your attention to the uh, Exhibit C, which does demonstrate the landscaping in green that will be installed with this redevelopment. That wraps up my testimony on finding number one. If there are not any questions, I'll turn it over to Brian Soltz, our site designer, to provide testimony on findings two and three. Here is a question from um, Mr. Meadows. Jen. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Biker. I have a, a question for you. The, the current McDonald's has uh, two drive-through uh, lanes or one drive-through lane? I'd have to refer that to Brian. I know I've gone through that drive-through and gotten uh, value meals on many occasions, but I'm afraid I'd be remiss okay. if I... I... I will ask him, but let me follow up with this question. Um, is there any requirement uh, that you're aware of uh, in the UDO for this McDonald's to have two drive-through lanes? I think in order for it to meet the stacking on site that yeah, it was necessary to align it this way, uh, Brian Soltz is the, the guru of of um, these design, mm, okay. uh, these design uh, exercises, and it is uh, it is consistent with uh, I think the vast majority of new restaurants, Chick Fil A, Wendy's, what have you. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Biker before we can move on? Mr. Souls. Good morning, board. Thank you for hearing our case this morning. I am Brian Soltz. I'm with Commercial Site Design. I'm a principal um, with the firm. Uh, our offices are located at 8312 Creedmoor Road in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, I would like um, to point out my resume and briefly go through my experience and qualifications. I'm certified by the American Institute of Certified Planners, and I've 
land planning degree in urban and regional planning. I've been practicing land planning and uh, for 26 years, and I've been a consultant for McDonald's Corporation for 15 of those years. Um, I've been involved with hundreds of McDonald's projects, and I'm happy to present this one to you today. Um, I was brought in to prepare this site plan and to lead my team of engineers, stormwater specialists, landscape architects, land planning, uh, to develop this site um, with a new McDonald's uh, building. Uh, it's not a change of use. McDonald's is the property owner um, and will remain the property owner. Um, it would just be a new building. Um, in preparing for this testimony, I have reviewed the site plan, the materials, the application, the staff report, and the attachments that we're presenting today um, as part of um, my, my review and offer them as part of your, the record for you. As Patrick stated, I'm gonna address uh, the second finding of the UDO section 3.14.8, uh, the strict application of the ordinance in regards to the, um, in this regard would result in an unnecessary hardship. Therefore, we present three conditions particular to this property that contribute to the unnecessary hardship relating to the redevelopment of this McDonald's. As noted before, first, the split zone condition of the property. If the entirety of the McDonald's property were zone CN, no project boundary buffer would be required along the western portion of the property. Second, the location of McDonald's property being located in the suburban tier rather than the urban tier creates a hardship associated with the UDO's tree coverage requirements. The urban tier stretches approximately 6.25 miles north um, to the south, centered on the downtown um, Durham districts. In the urban tier, if the urban tier stretched just three quarters of a mile north, the McDonald's property would be in the urban tier and the tree coverage would only be 3% instead of the 15% that is required of this parcel. The third item of hardship is the odd shape of the parcel. Um, after McDonald's uh, builds sidewalks, dedicates right of ways, um, our estimate is that the parcel is only 1.065 acres. Nevertheless, the because the parcel is slightly over one acre in size, um, the tree coverage, only tree coverage area is greater than 1,000 square feet in size and greater than 25 feet dimensionally can count towards meeting the tree coverage requirements of UDO per section 8.3.1D.3.B. Point point um, fitting all the other UDO required elements on this oddly shaped parcel um, leaves only one contiguous area of sufficient size and dimension to qualify for tree coverage. This is shown in the upper right-hand corner of exhibit C um, and it's labeled. Um, and while the plan uh, uses the eligible areas tree coverage, it still falls short of the overall 15% requirement. And the project boundary buffers because of the split zoning location in the suburban tier and the shape and size of the parcel contribute to that. Now I'll move on to the third finding, which is that the hardship did not result from the actions taken by the applicant or the property owner. Of record, McDonald's has owned this parcel of property since the 1970s. Accordingly, since the zoning regulations pertaining to project boundary buffers and the suburban tier tree coverage standards became effective upon adoption of the UDO in January of 2006. None of the hardships presented in this application were a result of the actions taken by McDonald's Additionally, the split zoning of this parcel was, was not applied through any application or request of McDonald's. All these hardships are a function of a passage of time and additional requirements for redevelopment imposed by the UDO. This concludes my testimony. I'll be happy to answer the questions presented previously to Mr. Biker um, or any other questions that you have. Any questions for Mr. Saltz or Mr. Biker? Mr. Meadows has his hand raised. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Uh, um, yeah, Mr. Saltz, please, the same question I asked Mr. Biker. I am curious about the um, number of drive through uh, lanes in the current uh, configuration um, and, and also um, the whether or not the UDO requires two drive-through lanes for the, the, the new configuration. The, 
the current configuration of the drive through is a single lane. Okay. Um, that is the way it operates today. Um, it does cause issue with uh, the stacking requirements of code. They would mm -hmm. block some of the required parking spots as they exist today if it were to remain in function under current UDO standards. So the proposed um, is, a, is a, a genius approach by McDonald's to allocate um, extra space for uh, cars to queue while placing orders. Um, um, known that placing the order is one of the longest transactional periods of the ordering process. It allows for a second car uh, to queue up and place an order simultaneously with two order takers um, inside the restaurant um, and allows for queuing and safe stacking areas so that required parking, required circulation, required ADA access are not blocked while still meeting all the UDI requirements. Thank you. One, one more follow-on question. If, um, and, I, and I, I'm asking you to speculate, if, if the second drive-through lane uh, was not present on the eastern side of the building, I think it's the eastern side, um, there would be an additional 10 feet. Would that enable um, the, the McDonald's Corporation to provide the tree cover to avoid the, the need for a, uh, a variance from the tree coverage requirements, in your opinion? In my opinion, no. Um, the removal of a, of a lane adds 10 feet um, in cross dimension to the property. Um, adding 10 feet to the green areas that we do show around the perimeter of the property would only create a 20 foot wide area Mm -hmm. um, the UDO requires tree coverage areas to be 25 foot wide. Mm -hmm. um, thus, a variance would still be needed in the dimensional standard requirements of the of what of the UDO in regards to tree coverage. Thank you. Uh, staff would like to join real quick just to answer a question for Mr. Meadows as well. There is not a UDO requirement for the number of lanes. We more so have requirements for the amount of stacking that's required for pickup window and order points. Um, Mr. Retchless's hand is raised. Hi. Uh, hi, Mr. Saltz. Uh, question about the tree coverage. Of your 3% of the tree coverage you're uh, putting in there, are you thinking about uh, particular trees to make up for that deficit? Um, it's such a wide gap there. Um, is there a better tree than not to put in the very limited space you have? Or, or is there specific trees you have appointed to go in that buffer? Um, great question. Um, Within the tree coverage areas, um, the UDO addresses um, uh, the replacement of the trees, um, th the quantity. Um, the UDO also specifies um, spacing of trees um, within areas. Uh, you, you can only place you know, large canopy trees um, within a certain space of, um, of each other. So it, you know, given the area that we're providing, you are sort of limited in regards to the numbers. You can't just put a, um, um, a large amount of trees in that area just to account for areas that may not have any. Um, and that's good because um, the trees do need the space to grow and mature and survive. Um, so we are proposing uh, large canopy trees in the tree coverage area. Uh, the tree coverage area is um, located um, along the Roxborough uh, Road street frontage. Um, and, you know, as part of that canopy area, we, we also saw it as a good opportunity for screening of the, uh, um, of the facility in that, in that section. Um, it does, the trees proposed up there do match some other trees. Um, they are uh, willow oaks that we're proposing throughout the project. Um, and, you know, while, you know, we're, we are talking about perimeter buffer reduction in one area, um, like Mr. Biker noted, there's number there's areas of the property where a perimeter buffer isn't necessarily required, um, where the uh, CN zoning touches the CN zoning, particularly to the to the west, um, where we uh, the convenience store um, butts up to us, and also where 
the um, tire uh, facility, um, tire chain service facility butts up to us. Um, those areas we are providing uh, trees and uh, landscape area over there. Um, so we've sort of taken the green areas that we can provide on our site and, and spread them evenly as exhibit C shows with the, with the green areas. You can see that it's sort of an even distribution of green throughout the project uh, versus maybe grouping them in one, one, one location or another because of the fact that we could never achieve the, the, the width um, in the, th the width requirement of the tree coverage area. So, um, but we do, we are happy with the proposed trees and I believe they've been reviewed by staff and, and accepted. Um, and this was not our first um, revision of that. There was some changes to that based upon staff recommendations. Excellent, thank you. Um, DeLacy has her hand raised. I will um, add, Eliza Henry from staff speaking, I will add to what Mr. Schultz said. The trees were reviewed based upon the landscape manual requirements and there were revisions done by the applicant in order to um, meet those requirements in terms of type, quantity, and location for spacing. Right, Mr. Lacey. Um, I have a question about traffic flow in the stacking lanes. Is it the um, genius idea that two lanes on the right side of the building would can, uh, be serviced by uh, order takers at the top of the building and that island and then uh, proceed into to merge into one lane to the left of the building? Is that how it goes? Yes, um, okay. the, the approach is the approach is two lane approach. Mm -hmm. um, it, some of the ones that you may have seen around the community um, have a single lane approach um, in the past, but we've found that the single lane approach can cause confusion uh, for customers and on you know sort of uh, cars stacking in not an appropriate way um, when approaching the two. So we've uh, the newer designs of McDonald's drive-through lanes are the, the dual lane approach to, to line the cars up um, prior to getting to the split order taking uh, position. Um, it's, we've found that it's safer and more and, and keeps the circulation pattern intact. So the entire side of the building is car stacking and only where those two squares are is the order taking place and they pick up their food on the left-hand side of the building? That's correct. The okay. back area where the green is in the back of the building, that's where the order taking occurs. Okay. So I imagine you have a yield sign planned and say, uh, so that there won't be any um, surprises from one car pulling out after the other. Yes, the, the merge point is, is something we've all been become accustomed to over the years, but there is some signage on uh, noting the merge and also the orders are placed in while simultaneous, they're often staggered so that they can proceed forward in a, in a safe fashion. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant, Mr. Saltz or Mr. Biker? No, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to address the fourth finding and then give a brief conclusion. Please do. Mr. Chairman, Patrick Biker again, attorney for the applicant uh, or for McDonald's. I need to address the fourth finding, which is that the requested variance is consistent with the spirit, purpose, and intent of the ordinance, such that public safety is secured and substantial justice is achieved. Pursuant to section 1.2.2 of the UDO, the purpose and intent of the UDO is reflected in subsections G and K, and that includes both, quote, minimize congestion in the streets and reduce reliance on automobiles by providing options for walking, bicycling, and transit use, and also provide adequate transportation and public facilities. The redevelopment of this McDonald's that's before you this morning will bring sidewalk construction to Horton Road and North Roxborough Street, thereby providing options for walking and creating public facilities that do not exist today. It is also the spirit of the UDO to pr promote pedestrian connectivity and the new site plan submitted with this variance provides pedestrian connectivity from the new McDonald's to a convenience store a tire shop, and other nearby restaurants. Second, public safety also will be enhanced because the four current driveways, access driveways that are on site, will be reduced to two. This includes the elimination of the driveway on North Roxborough Street closest to the Horton and North Roxborough intersection. 
Third, longtime commercial property owners should not commercial property owners should not be prevented from dramatically improving their property and increasing Durham's commercial tax base. Durham County contains only 298 square miles, and so redevelopments of this type, <clears throat> excuse me, should be encouraged and supported through reasonable variance requests, such as the case before the board today. For all these reasons, public safety is secured and substantial justice is achieved by granting these two variances. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, for all these reasons, I think McDonald's has met the four required findings of UDO section 3.14. The board has received competent material and substantial evidence in regards to one, how the unnecessary hardship results from the strict application of the ordinance. The unnecessary hardship is that the minimum parking requirements could not be met on this site. Second, Mr. Soltz addressed that strict application of the ordinance uh, is a problem given the unique location and shape of the property that's before you today and including the split zoning condition. Third, it is clear that the hardship did not result from actions taken by McDonald's because McDonald's has owned this property for several decades. And fourth, the requested variances are consistent with the spirit, purpose, and intent of the UDO for the reasons I just stated. Accordingly, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, we respectfully ask for these variances to be granted. Uh, again, Mr. Soltz and I will be happy to answer any questions you may have, and we thank you very much for your time today under these uh, challenging conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Biker. Is there any questions for the applicant? Are there any questions? All right, um, discussion among the board. Any thoughts? I have some, this is Chad. Um, so the, the building is getting smaller and I think that's a good thing. Um, the impervious surface is getting smaller and I think that's a good thing. Um, the sidewalks are going in, I think that's a great thing. Um, and I'm very happy about that part of it. Um, I, despite that, I'm, I'm, I, I'm struggling with the tree, uh, with the, the tree retention, the, the tree protection um, compliance. Um, I, I'm, I don't know how I'm gonna vote on this, but I'll tell you that I, I'm not sure I agree that the hardship that we're dealing with here, at least along Roxborough Street, didn't result from the addition of the second drive-through lane. Um, I am not certain that rotating the building 180 degrees um, might allow things to be shifted over to the west. I, I don't know the answer. I'm not a staff. Uh, I'm not a, a site planner, uh, but I will say that um, I am not sure that this is the, 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 the minimum change necessary. Uh, and, and so I, I think it's a good project and I'm, I'm happy that it's redeveloping. Uh, I wish, I, I sort of feel caught uh, between what I think is a good thing on one hand and sort of uh, uh, would have been nice to try a little bit harder on the trees on the other. Um, so that's my thought. I, 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 I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts or ideas about this. Chad, what, what, what is your thought on the trees? I, I guess I'm not following it. So there's a variance for tree cover, uh, tree retention uh, that's being requested. And it's, it, the, 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 the claim is that this variance is necessary to, to meet the parking standard. Um, I think that uh, an alternate configuration of the drive-throughs might make it necessary to provide additional space for trees on this site, which would reduce the amount of variance that they need. And that's where I'm coming from. Okay. Any other thoughts from board members? Lacey? Mr. Lacey. Um, I've uh, driven past the, this, uh, this restaurant a number of times and through the area. And although it will be sad to lose those crepe myrtles, uh, it would be a worse thing to have someone lose life or limb uh, walking in the street. There's sidewalks almost everywhere and there's no sidewalks uh, on Horton Road by this restaurant. And although I, gr I agree that um, uh, green is, greenscape is very important, um, I think this is a tough choice that should be made towards uh, the health and safety of the population. Yeah, that's a very good point. I was 
I was actually thinking the same. Mr. Lasis, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, any, uh, uh, anyone else? Any this thoughts? Is, this is Retchless. I also, uh, I think the only thing for myself was the trees as well, but I see uh, they made some revisions. They they put a little more thought into what they could do with that remaining space. And I, I concur with uh, um, Ms. DeLacy that um, this is very cleaned up. It's, it's going to be a safe um, use for pedestrians. And uh, I, I think it's a... Uh, a well thought out, cleaned up project. Thank you. Anyone else? Looking at looking at the, uh, the looking at the application before, uh, I guess preparing for this meeting, I was looking at this drawing compared to what there is now. Um, I think that this is a. a you know, one, the sidewalks is one thing that's a great, great addition um, and much needed in an area that like that um, or in this area. But also, you know, having this, uh, you know, basically it looks like this entire site is going to be surrounded in trees in, in space. So that's, that's really good to see. Also, it's nice to see in, uh, impervious surfaces decrease and and even a building footprint, it looks like, uh, is decreasing. That's uh, interesting. Uh, and I, you know, one one of the reasons, uh, those are two of the reasons why I'll support this. But any other thoughts from board members before we ask for a motion? Does anyone have a motion? Mr. Lacey? Mr. Lacey. Um, uh, I hereby make a motion uh, that application B2 0013 and application for a request for a variance from the project boundary buffer along the right of way, the project boundary buffer between two zoning districts and the tree coverage requirements on property located at 4301. North Roxborough Street has successfully met the applicable requirements of the Unified Development Ordinance and is hereby granted subject to the following conditions, that the improvements shall be substantially consistent with the plans and all information submitted to the board as part of this application. We've got a motion, is there a second? Uh, Mike, I see your lips moving. <laughs> right, let's second. All right, uh, Susan. What do you call the board? Mr. Meadows. <clears throat> yes. Mr. Kipp. Yes. Mr. Rogers. Yes. Ms. DeLacy. Yes. Mr. Retchless. Yes. Ms. Major. Yes. Ms. Wymore. Yes. Motion carries seven to zero. A uh, vote of seven to zero, your variances have been uh, approved. You'll get an order in the mail pretty soon, and we appreciate you coming before the BOA this morning. Thank you very much for your time. Thank appreciate you. it. Well, let's, uh, uh, is there an interest to take a 10 minute break before the next case? Okay, all right, uh, let's take a 10 minute break. It is 10.04, we will reconvene at 10.14.
We almost have everyone back. Once Jessica gets back, we'll get this, we'll resume. I'm here, Jessica Dockery. Jessica Major. Jessica Major's screen is up. I do not see Jessica Major, Eliza Monroe, staff. There we are. All right, uh, Susan, would you like to call the next case? You're muted. Okay, case B2000014, a request for a minor special use permit to allow the location and size of future construction of buildings to the existing museum the subject site is located at 433 West Murray Avenue, 707 West Murray Avenue, and 115 West Britina Avenue. The site is split zone residential urban, residential suburban, commercial general. It is located within the Falls of the Noose Jordan Lake Protected Area Watershed Protection Overlay and in the urban tier. This case has been advertised for the required period of time and property owners within 600 feet have been notified. Authorized affidavits verifying the sign postings and letter mailings are on file and the seating for case B2000014 is Ms. DeLacy, Mr. Kip, Mr. Meadows, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Retchless, Ms. Major, Ms. Wymore. All right, uh, and now we'll uh, swear in the uh, uh, applicants or our witnesses for this case. And let me, I think I saw them on here. Uh, all right, if you will raise your right hand, uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm that your testimony and evidence shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you. And do you consent to this remote format meeting? I do. Yes, I do. Thank you. All right. We'll turn it over to uh, Eliza. Are you the one? Are you the staff? Yes, that's correct. This is with mine. Okay. Um, so Eliza Monroe with this planning department. St planning staff does request that the staff report and all materials submitted at the public hearings be made part of the public record with any necessary corrections as noted. Thank you, so noted. Thank you. Okay, so case B200014 is a request for a minor special use permit to allow the location and size of future construction of buildings to the existing museum site. The applicant is Tim Somerville with Stewart. Um, the subject site is amongst three different parcels, and those are going to be 433 West Murray Avenue, 707 West Murray Avenue, and 115 West Britannia Avenue. The case area is highlighted in red, so you can kind of see the three parcels that I mentioned um, there. Um, the site is in the urban tier. It does have multiple zoning districts, and those include residential urban 5-2, residential suburban 8 or RS8, and com commercial general CG. Um, it is located within the Falls of News Jordan Lake Protected Area Watershed Protection Overlay District, um, and it is within the city's jurisdiction. The site is currently the North Carolina Museum of Life and Science. Um, so there are several different exhibits, parking deck, as well as building structures on the site. Um, 
through the applicants proposing what um, they would like to consider a master land use plan, so how they would like to go forward with development on the museum site. It is currently a museum and the uses that they're proposing would be accessory uses that are in line with museum uses. Um, UDO section 5.1.2 allows a museum within a residential zoning district um, with the approval of a minor special per use permit by the Board of Adjustment. Um, the use is subjected to the limited use standards listed in UDO section 5.3.3G. The future development of the site will have to meet the limited use standards, the unified development ordinance at that time, as well as any all um, other applicable codes at that time. All projects will be going through a uh, individual site plan for review and approval. Um, and speaking with the applicant, this idea to have a future land use map was to kind of lessen the amount of times that they come to the board for each project, because since they are in zoning districts where all three of them will require um, a new minor special use permit, um, they decided to come instead and with a larger overall plan um, and get the plan approved. Um, so that is the reasoning kind of their thought process behind them being before us today, as opposed to having to do several MSUP applications. Um, UDO section 3.9.8a and b establishes four findings and 13 review factors that the applicant must meet in order for the board to grant a use permit. These findings and review factors are identified in the staff report and the applicant's responses to the findings and review factors are identified in the application, both of which are within your packet and staff will be available for any questions as needed during the hearing process. Any questions for Eliza before we continue? Mr. Meadows has his hand raised. I, I have one quick one. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eliza. Uh, you said something that I wanted to be sure that I understood. Uh, I thought I heard you say that each of the site plans that are proposed um, or, or that would carry forward under this, uh, under this minor special use would be subject to the rules in place at the time that the application for the, the site plan is submitted. Is, is that did, did I hear you correctly? That is correct. So this use permit is to allow the speculative location and speculative uses um, as kind of called out, which I can go through the four sheets that are here. Um, however, each of those buildings will have to go through um, any UDO requirements at that time. Today is just to kind of give the speculative location here, but each of them will have to go through site plan review. Um, they're deemed what's called the substantial change from the original use permit that the museum received. Um, so because of that, they'll each have to go through a site plan review. And if the board approves this today, they will not have to go through an MSUP review as well. Okay. Um, do you foresee any uh, possibility of conflict or inconsistency uh, between the special use permit that we're, uh, the minor special use permit that we're considering today based on this plan and uh, UDO changes that may take place, you know, in five or 10 years? Not that um, staff can speculate at this time. Um, I wanted to mention that at the beginning so that you all know that because these are speculative um, sizes and locations, we did um, express to the applicant and they may can speak to this as well, that this document here does provide some very state gu strict guidelines. So if the board approves um, what's on your screen here, um, a speculative, 2,000, 25,000 square foot main building expansion, they would be limited to that parameter. Um, so I don't think there'll be any UDO changes that will drastically affect things, but I wanted to mention it that if there is, they would have to be in compliance with that, um, as well as any conditions that the board proposes today, if there are any. Thank you. Any other questions for Eliza? Um, De Lacey has her hand raised. Uh, thanks, uh, DeLacy. Uh, Eliza, why are the uh, why is it discontinuous? On you had the two red uh, on the previous slide. You had two red things. Is there it discontinuous just because there's a, a street in the middle of it? That's correct. Um, the street is not a part of the property, um, so that's going to be the right of way that runs. So the portion, and I'm going to turn back on my cool little purple marker here. Um, this portion here that I'm like kind of drawing a line across is 433 West Murray, um, which is the museum um, across the street is 717 West Murray across, um, and these parcels. And then back here is the Britannia one. 
So there are three individual parcels, all a part of the museum use. They currently are all being used um, for the museum uses and the proposed additions are throughout these three parcels. Thank you, ma'am. Any other questions for staff? Um, I'm going through to make sure no one's raising their hand. If I miss you, please feel free to speak to her. All right, uh, would the applicant come forward? Hey, good morning. <laughs> this is Tim Somerville with Stewart, uh, located at 101 West Main Street. Um, and I would like our application to be entered into the record. Um, I'm here today to represent the museum. And really, I think Eliza did a great job explaining what we're here for today. Um, the museum has several projects uh, slated for the next 5, 10, 15 years for development. You know, every time they want to put a new building on the museum campus, we had to go through a special use permit as well as a site plan application. So we're here today to get an overall master plan uh, approval special use permit for the museum use so that any ancillary building built in the future will, uh, we, we will go through a site plan review to meet, make sure that building is meeting the, uh, all the requirements of the UDO, but we would not have to go through the special use permit process. Um, and I'd also like to introduce Roy Griffiths, who's here with the museum, and he is, he's just here to answer any questions that anyone may have. So with that, I'd just like to open it up to any questions you may have. Okay, um, any, any questions for Mr. Somerville? I've got one. Uh, uh, Tim, would you mind walking us through what what we're looking at here and uh, what you know what are some of these uh, potential you know future uses that, that that the museum wants to do? Yeah, what are, what are the big ideas. Yeah, if you look in the bottom right corner, there's a list of what these would all be. Um, you know, some of these buildings are going to be storage buildings on site. Some of them are going to be you know additional office buildings, um, classroom buildings you know, picnic shelter, a retail expansion. So it's really just adding more uh, uses, buildings to help the museum function, uh, you know, from a functionality standpoint, as well as from a user experience. You know, there's, for example, right in the middle there of your screen, there's a square for uh, new picnic shelters. Uh, they could come online to provide, you know, additional places to have picnics out of the museum. Uh, the bottom left corner, there's you know future consideration for a parking deck expansion. Um, there's you know consideration of expanding the main museum building, which is uh, located right along uh, Murray Avenue. So, again, a lot of these are just you know future uh, ideas that the museum has you know moving forward as you know budgets allow in the next five, 10, 15 years to further their operations as well as uh, the user experience. All right, what, what is, um, what's the difference between, um, uh, or what are, let me see if I can frame the question correctly. Um, what is there now compared to what we're seeing on this, on this visual? Um, there's a mix of, yeah, of what's existing. You know, there are storage, there's office, there's restrooms out there. Um, I could just say, you know, on the bottom, you see that big dark rectangle right there, that's the existing parking deck that was completed a few years ago. Um, and then around that, there's some uh, current classroom buildings uh, just to the north of that that are existing today. And then a future one proposed to kind of make that more of a classroom type campus setting. You know, the main museum building is there right north of, uh, of Murray Avenue and you know, the proposed expansions outside of that. Um, you know, there's some, the existing farmhouse you're aware of that have you know, different barns for different animals. There's a proposal to add an additional animal, uh, you know, barn for their habitat in there. So, you know, a lot of this on here, yeah, is, is existing and, you know, the proposed would be planned in the future to uh, be around it. Yeah, I'm actually not familiar with the site. I, I've, I've okay. written by it, uh, you know, prior to, to, to this hearing to just take a look, but, um, so I, I, I don't think I've ever visited this museum. I should, but well, yeah, uh, yeah. If they ever open again. <laughs> yeah. Encourage you to go. Absolutely. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Griffiths or Mr. Somerville? Meadows. Mr. Meadows. 
Um, I, I, I just wanted to um, echo, I think maybe one of a little bit of the confusion that, that you're expressing, uh, Chair Rogers. I, I do know this site. I'm a member of this museum uh, and, I, and I love the facility. Uh, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, I admit to being a little uncomfortable here uh, as I'm not even sure, I do know this site, but I'm not sure what's, what's new or proposed versus what's existing. I see some things that, are, that have the word proposed in front of them. Uh, I'm reasonably certain there's no visitor center um, in the northern quadrant of the existing site near the tram line, uh, but it, it lacks the word uh, proposed. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure what we're uh, approving, and I don't see any sort of breakdown of square footage of, um, you know, I, I do see that there's the general uh, sort of list down there, but it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's a little bit more vague than I would like uh, to, to be able to make a decision, particularly uh, on the east side of the site where the operations center expansion uh, is taking place or might be taking place uh, and appears to be, you know, somewhat proximate to the lot line. So that's, I think, my, my concern and I'm I'm, I'm really wishing that I could have a deeper understanding about what is new and, and what is existing. Um, it, it looks like maybe some of the new things have a, a crosshatch pattern. Is that accurate? Yeah, some of the new things have a crosshatch pattern, but majority everything that is new that it's proposed in the future should have a leader leading to it with uh, approximate square footage. Of what it'll be in the future so you know you can look the right in the middle of the picnic shelters um you know we have a leader lead into what those would be and the uh, approximate square footage of them same with you know at the front of the the front of the main building the, the new entries plaza new entry shops for uh, expanding the retail portion so anything that's proposed has a call out that it would be and then as these come online, we submit a site plan to the planning department. I've, they would go back check this uh, special use permit um, that you're considering today to see that it lines up with what you have has approved today. There is a question from Ms. Wymore. Lisa. Hi, thanks. I want to just piggyback on on Mr. Meadows' points as well, and and in particular, um, you know, this is a very uh, residential area, and traffic flow there is very difficult as it is. Um, my question is, with regard to the area around Britannia, is this going to be a public access, or is it specific to operations for the museum staff, or how is that working? there in particular because that is a dead end area um, where Delafield and Britannia are. Um, so traffic flow there is might be tough. Okay, that will that will only be entrance for museum staff only. That will not be a public use. The only public uh, use will be off of Murray Avenue where it currently is today. Thank you. Other thoughts, you know. Mr. Meadows has. Oh, go, um, what'd you say, Eliza? Meadows has his hand raised. I have one more question. You know, I'm. I'm. Uh, uh, let me go get ahead. the thought out. Uh, I'm just. I have no idea what we're looking at. Uh, or, or, and again, like, what are what are the uses of these? I mean, I really think, and it may take a minute, but we need to go through everything that's proposed and say what. What are, what are, what's the use of, a, of, of the building expansion? I have no idea what's in that building. Um, so I don't know what is it used for. I see that it's office or maybe an office, but I don't know. Um, I don't know if it's worth, you know, I'm, I'm just throwing some stuff out here that I, you know, while I've overlooked all of this stuff, I'm still not, and I get it that it's a big master plan and it, but just, just my thought, Mr. Meadows. Uh, thank you, and I agree, uh, and, and I'll give you a case in point. Um, there is a building in the southeast corner of the site called a quarantine building. I assume that's for animals, but I don't know. Um, so yeah, I, I think 
it, it certainly would be helpful to have more description about what's being proposed, whether we do that now or we ask for some supplemental information. Mr. Somerville, how do you want to do this? Um, I mean, if you want, we can go through, you know, each one of what they're proposing. But again, this is this was a master plan, um, you know, that's going to have five, 10, 15 year build out. Um, you know, and, and each one of these has to go through a site plan review. And like Eliza mentioned, you know, these are all ancillary uses to the museum as a whole. Museum is a permitted use within the zoning district, but any, but as a special use permit. So what we're seeking today is a special use permit for expansion to the museum as a whole, um, not exactly each individual building, um, but you know we can go through each one. But I don't know, and maybe Eliza, you could answer the question if we don't want to try to think how to phrase it. You know how. We don't want to be too general with each one of these buildings and I understand you don't want us to have carte blanche on what we propose out there in the future because that's what we're here for and that's the whole use but I just want to reiterate that this these are all ancillary ancillary uses to the museum campus, um, which is an allowable use. Uh, yeah, so staff will I'll kind of just follow up to what Tim was requesting us to kind of go over here um, based upon the what we had asked the applicant to provide was speculative locations of buildings. Um, so to actually backtrack, during the pre-submittal process, it was understood that due to different fundings from grants, um, whether that's state, federal, however, what have you, um, the time frame in which we currently had processes uh, for the BOA, for the applicant to have to go through the BOA and site plan review was um, butting up against grant funding on a consistent basis. So this was the result of that um, information provided by the applicant. So thus staff um, asked the applicant to provide this document here, which goes over the um, things that they would like to do. Um, all grant funding considered, uh, millions of dollars coming in over the next couple of years, this is what the applicant would like to do. Um, so there were, during that time, we asked the applicant to provide um, any potential uses they would like to, and that's what's in this bottom right-hand corner. Um, so the idea here was that uh, these spaces should be either, um, either of these uses, so storage, office, restroom, picnic, shelter, classroom, or retail all accessory to the overall museum use on the existing buildings there. Um, so that being said, that's kind of the things that we request of the applicant. And I, if we would like to go through each one, uh, myself and Tim could definitely do that with you all today in order to provide some clarity. Um, that is perfectly fine. But I um, am just gonna kind of go through the different ones here to just highlight. Um, so the location here um, to answer your question, Mr. Rogers, and I do see your hand, Regina. Um, the way that at least we were told with the applicant um, is that there is um, with these smaller buildings uh, they called out what they would like it to be so they say ex exhibit program building um, school group visitor center and entrance I'm going to turn on my annotate function so I can kind of talk as I go through um, so we've got here an exhibit program building and that's called out um, for things that are supposed to be um, new. Um, the 3,500, um, I, I believe that's, I don't know what AD stands for, my apologies, um, school group, visitor center, um, expansions to the main building. Each of those call outs were supposed to be the future um, buildings there. Uh, in terms of clarity and whether or not this drawing is clear, um, we can go through it day by day today, or as Mr. Meadows mentioned earlier, if we do need to have additional information, I will leave that to the board to decide how they would like to proceed. You know, I think it I think it's great that this is expanding. I love the idea of it. I'm obviously, I'm in support of that. But um, just, just, I just that was my original thought. Uh, Mr. Lacey, did you have something? Yeah, I just uh, would like to remind the board members who were uh, who were there at the time of the lively uh, discussion when the original parking deck was put in. And uh, that went on for like 40 minutes. Uh, concerned about lighting, I believe was our yeah. biggest one. I believe it, we, uh, I'm not sure what changes we made to it, but uh, that involved the neighborhood and the discussion uh, about lighting. 
Um, other than that, I love the uh, the museum. Uh, I really appreciate that it's uh, so uh, interactive, especially with young people. And I like the idea of future tram line stop because I'm old and that's a long way. That's uh, it. Staff would like to interject really quickly. I saw Mr. Griffiths has his hand raised, so I want to um, allow him to speak. Uh, I will kind of add to what Regina just said, just then that um, about the lighting. Uh, that was a previous case, so not something we can consider today. Um, and any of the attorneys can jump in at any time if I'm wrong in that statement. Um, and I just would like to highlight that any lighting for the future will have to meet the standards at the time of the ordinance. Um, so from that note, I will turn it Thank over you. to Mr. Griffith, who had his hand raised, I'm assuming, to respond to something the board has asked. Yeah, thank you very much for hearing our request here. Um, I, uh, I have been in my current role uh, developing the museum site uh, over the last 25 years. And uh, with regard to the, um, uh, the type of development that's being proposed here, it's very consistent with balancing uh, the use in the museum as we know it today. We, uh, we love this natural site that we are on and we balance everything we do um, to preserve that. So with regard to the types of uses or at least the impact those uses would have either on the current experience or um, the uh, natural setting of the site, uh, if it helps you to hear me say that it's very much uh, in keeping with the spirit of the museum that you know today. Um, and, and the comment was made about the parking deck uh, in the discussions relative to that when we went through this very same process a few years ago. And I'll reflect to you um, my experience with that in working very closely with the Northgate uh, community uh, group um, and Northgate Park uh, community group. Uh, and we, uh, and I personally worked and had many, many meetings with that, with that group. Um, and uh, you'll notice today that um, none of those are, uh, individuals are here and I've had in fact, one exchange uh, with one of their members uh, uh, for this particular proposal and there were no issues, but the, the underlying point there is that we uh, strive on being a good neighbor. The, the, the impetus behind the parking deck uh, was to move traffic off of Murray Avenue because of its impact, if we can just speak to that for a moment. And it has done that and, and the neighborhood has appreciated it. We don't exist in this location without that relationship with the neighborhood. And we, we won't exist and be successful as the museum that has grown over many, many years without retaining the value for this wonderful site and, uh, and, and keeping that balance in mind as we develop uh, our planning. But it is a large site. That's the reason for the tram, um, and uh, it's a you know a relatively small uh, impact in terms of, of of what we're imagining here, as are each of these ancillary uh, other ancillary uh, uh, functions. Uh, but um, you know we 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 do recognize that as as people um, use and explore more of our site, there do need to be accommodations along the way that make that um, um, easy and possible for them, whether it's a, a small program shelter or a restroom building. And so these are the kinds of things that we're talking about. And I'm happy to answer any other questions. Uh, Mr. Meadows has his hand raised. Thank you, Eliza. Um, so I very, very, very quickly, and I'm not a math student, uh, so just keep, keep that in mind. Uh, I added up the uh, square footage numbers that were listed on the site plan that we're looking at here, and it is somewhat apples and oranges because some things are picnic shelters and other things are buildings. Um, the number that I came up with, and I'm, I'm you know, wondering um, 
you know, uh, if, if other people came up with this number, is 101,500 square feet. Uh, so what's proposed here is an additional uh, over 100,000 square feet of, of building area, some of it enclosed, some of it not enclosed. Um, how much floor area is on the site right now? Uh, and so what sort of a percentage increase are we talking about with this master plan? Give me a minute, I can look that up right now. And uh, Eliza Monroe staff, um, I'm also doing the same if my eyes are not um, front and center, um, looking it up as well in terms of the overall um, existing square footage of all buildings. I was, I was not able to find that on the tax card, but I, you know, I, might, I may not be doing it correctly. So um, mm -hmm. uh, again, I, I, I just want to reiterate the point I made already. Uh, I love this site. Uh, I am a member here. I, I visit the museum regularly uh, and I am happy to see some changes, but I'm not comfortable approving 100,000 square feet of floor area uh, without a little bit more detail. Any other questions? Thoughts? Um, in an effort to look, I am not monitoring the raise hand function. So if anyone would like to speak, um, I am not monitoring that function at this time. Yeah. Lacey? Um, it, even though it's 100,000 square feet, uh, it's a very large plot of land. And uh, I know that uh, personally, an extra restroom would not go amiss. And I'm also like to talk about funding. Uh, I've had quite an extensive uh, experience with government funding and it, the, the time constraints are real and can make the difference between getting something done and not getting it done. If you get the approval with you, you think it's gonna take eight weeks and then, then it rains or somebody goes out on strike, you could wind up not getting your funding and there you are with a half finished building. So I sympathize with um, the, the, the uh, problem with especially government funding. Um, and I think that this was a wise and considered approach to giving as much slack time to uh, the government to fund and uh, the building to go up. I, I have to agree with you, Regina, on that. That's something I really, I didn't think about until it was brought up just now. I do understand the, the constraints with that and timelines often do not line up and then as well as um, it can be a long arduous process, uh, bureaucrat, bureaucratic process, uh, bureaucracy process of, of, um, of getting to this board every time. I do understand that. Uh, so I agree with you. Rechless here. I want to just uh, add to uh, Ms. DeLacy's comment that there are, there are many layers of reviews and conditions and standards that will go with the approval of these buildings coming in the future. And I think the increase of public use uh, will go with that uh, expanded growth in the future. And I think it's uh, uh, our job as uh, the board is to look at the overall uh, picture here, the master plan and, and um, approve this. Um, Eliza Monroe here with the staff. Uh, just wanted to chime in. I'm only able to pull up a couple of the site plans, um, so my apologies that this will not be a complete number. Um, based upon the site plans D1300157, um, as well as D1400164, um, which shows the north side and south side um, buildings, those combine to be about 47,000 square feet. Um, the case numbers, the 13 and 14, denote the year, so 2013, 2014. Um, I am unable currently to pull up 
anything more recent than that. So that number might be um, either substantially lower or um, right on the money, depending upon what's been done in recent years. I do know there was one in 2018 um, that was done for, uh, I believe, a class one of the classrooms um, that was near the parking deck off of the, of the 433 West Murray um, site or parcel. Um, however, I'm doing all this on my iPad, so I am not able to um, pull it up on that. Yeah. So Tim, Eliza, I, I can give an update that. that, that <laughs> Eliza, this is Tim. Um, the, the site plan you're referring to, the most recent one was D13, or I'm sorry, D18-00385. It added a classroom um, to the south side of the building. On that site plan, the total square footage of buildings on site added up to 92,752, I think. Um, but that does not include the square footage of the parking deck that was recently built, um, which I think when you added up the proposed ones included a $35,000 park, th I'm sorry, 35,000 square foot parking deck, which is similar to the size of the one now. So if you include the parking deck in here, we're at, we're about 120,000 square feet of um, current square building square footage on the campus. Thank you, Tim. Any any other thoughts? I I have a thought. Um, I was I was a member of this museum when my kids were little, and they do fantastic programming, fantastic public spaces. So while no one would ever be given a blanket to do whatever they want. Um, if that were to ever happen, this would probably be the entity to trust to do that. So I have faith in this uh, museum and that they'll do the right thing. That said, we want clarity, but I just wanted to add that. That was Mr. Kip speaking. Very good point, Ian. Anyone else? Uh, Tim, is this the extent of your te testimony or do you have anything else? No, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's all I have. All righty. Um, okay. Well, staff, do you have a recommendation? Um, yes, I do. Hold on one moment. So sorry. Kind of started queuing up site plans on my iPad and didn't have the recommendation. Um, staff recommends the approval of case B20000014 um, such that the application is um, substantially consistent with the plans and information submitted to the board. All right. Um, discussion of board from um, between board. Any, any other thoughts? Um, I think we've heard from at least four. Tisha, Jessica, what are y'all thinking? Jessica Major, um, I think given that their funding relies on their ability to get their approval through this board pretty quickly, I am inclined to vote yes. Yes. Did you mention something? Did you say something, Tisha? I'm sorry. I, I will agree with that as well. I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of this museum. So personally, I like the idea. All right. Anybody else have any thoughts they'd like to share? All right. Uh, does anybody have a motion? Would like to make a motion? Lacey. Mr. Lacey. I hereby make a motion that application number B20000 14, an application for a minor special use permit on properties located at 433 West Murray Avenue, 707 West Murray Avenue, and 115 West Britannia Avenue have successfully met the application requirements of the Unified Development Ordinance 
and is hereby granted subject to the following conditions. The improvements shall be substantially consistent with the plans and information submitted to the board as part of the application. All right, we've got a motion. Uh, is there, um, Eliza, can we, uh, uh, there we go, thank you. Um, is there a second? Yep, second. All right, we've got a motion and a second. Uh, Susan, will you call? Ms. Juan Moore? Yes. Ms. Major? Yes. Mr. Retchless? Yes. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Mr. Meadows? No. Mr. Kipp? Yes. Ms. DeLacy? Yes. Motion carries six to one. By a vote of six to one, your minor special use permit has been approved. You'll receive an order uh, shortly from planning. Uh, we appreciate you coming before the BOA this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Um, Susan, would you like to call the next case? Sure, case B2000015, a minor special use permit to allow for a six foot tall length fence with barbed wire in the street frontage of the subject properties. The subject site is located at 5203 and 5325 Chin Page Road. The site is zoned industrial light and in the suburban tier. This case is advertised for the required period of time and property owners within 600 feet have been notified. Notarized academic it's verifying the sign postings and letter mailings are on file and the seating for case B2000015 is Ms. DeLacy, Mr. Kip, Mr. Meadows, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Retchless, Ms. Major, and Ms. Wymore. I think we've got our applicants on video here. I just want to make sure before we administer the oath. Are our witnesses an applicant, do we? So Mr. Sivers. Whoever plans to speak on this one, we'll need to uh, turn your video on so we can do the. Uh, so we have a couple of us that are gonna plan to speak, sir. Okay. Just... Uh, we're all actually all in the same room together. So we'll probably have to do that separately. To, uh, to try to avoid some echoing. Well, that's, I think we, as long as we can see them and I'm trying just making sure I can, and I think that'll work. All right, <clears throat> so I need you to raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that your testimony and evidence shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Yes. And do you uh, consent to the remote format of, in this meeting, of this meeting? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Cole, do you have this one? I do. Thank you. Over to you. Okay. Um, good morning. I'm Cole Ranniger, representing the planning department. Um, planning staff requested the staff report and all materials submitted at the public hearing to be made part of the public record with any necessary corrections as noted. Noted. Thank you. B20, sorry, 20015 is a minor special use permit for a six foot tall chain link fence with barbed wire in the 50 foot street frontage of both parcels along Chen Page Road. The applicant is Horvath Associates. Um, the, case area, the case area is highlighted in red. The site is in the suburban tier zoned industrial light, ILD, and is in within the city of, Dur of Durham's jurisdiction. Um, I would like to point out that as of right now, um, this has been, re um, the, con the context map has been um, revised. Um, that parcel that says this parcel is not part of the MSCP application. Um, there's another aerial photo that shows that that has been recombined, um, which I'll show at the end of the presentation. Um, but I'll continue. Um, the site area is currently um, vacant industrial. Um, and then 
a fence greater than four feet in height located between the structure and the street, except as an exempt by the Unified Development Ordinance, Section 9.9.1B, requires approval through MSUP by the Board of Adjustment, pursuant to Section 9.9.1, Fences and Walls Heights. This minor special use permit request is to allow the fence located in the street front of the lots to be taller than four feet. The applicant is requesting a six foot high chain link fence, um, chain link barbed wire fence. UDO section 3.9.AA and B established four findings and 13 review factors the applicant must meet in order for the board to grant a use permit. These findings and review factors are identified in the staff report and the applicant's responses to the findings and review factors are identified in the application both within your packet. Staff will be available for any questions at the end of the during of the hearing process. Um, I thought I had the updated version, but I will I will pull that up um, for this. Basically, it's just this parcel that's not in red. Is actually <clears throat> it's actually in part of it's been recombined to include that parcel. So this is just those two parcels with this included. Uh, <clears throat> questions for Cole before we hear from the applicant. I have a question. Mr. Where where are the two 50 foot street frontages with the barbed wire chain link fence? Okay, so um, in this area right here, the, the 50 foot street frontages, I believe this is correct. Tim, it's, it's right here and right here, correct? No, actually Cole, that's not correct. It's a long chin page road. Um, uh, if go back to the uh, your map with the red, please, if you will. Okay. It's it's the uh, from left to right. It's the first and second frontage along Chin Page Road. That third frontage along Chin Page Road and the uh, rectangle to the top right hand of your screen is actually outside of our project limits. So the the frontage for the increase in fence height is that first first and second portion along Chin Page Road as well as the uh, right away on the left-hand side of the screen. It's an unnamed road. It's actually a, a private right away that goes back to the industrial facility. That's correct, right along there as well. So those are the three locations. DeLacy, I have a question for Still Cole. Um, can, uh, I'm not a fan of barbed wire, mm -hmm. but can a uh, can you put a barbed wire fence uh, by right? Uh, yeah. Yes. So in this area, they are allowed by right uh, a barbed wire fence. Um, so the board can't say that's okay or not. They can only okay. just determine the height of that four fence. Okay. Thank um, you. So, yes. Any other questions for Cole? All right, well, uh, will the applicant come forward? Yes, this is Tim Stivers with Horvath Associates. Uh, I'm a licensed landscape architect in the state of North Carolina. My license number is 1576. I'll be available for any more questions, but Lynn Mitchell will actually be making the presentation this morning. Thank you, Jacob. Good morning. My name is Lynn Mitchell. I'm with Horvath Associates. Our address is 16 Consultant Place in Durham. I'm a landscape architect registered with the state of North Carolina. My license number is 2031. Hey, uh, Lynn, have you uh, been sworn in? No, no, sir. No. Well, let's go ahead and get, get that over with you. Okay. Right, right hand. Uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm that your testimony and evidence shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Please. I would, I would like to say that um, on the screen now, now, now showing the the exhibit that was sent to me. Um, for Thank better you, Cole. Clarity. <laughs> Sorry Thank about that. Thank you, Cole. No, that's fine. Um, we respectfully ask that all testimony and exhibits become a part of the public re record for these proceedings, please. Thank you. Um, Thank you, staff, for your assistance and coordination in preparing our petition. And Cole, you did a great job of presenting our request, so I'd like to only highlight a few specific items. Um, referring to the exhibit that Cole brought up, 
Um, this project is a, a FedEx freight facility. It's located on Chinpage Road and is currently under construction per site plan D19-00260, approved on January 6, 2020. Uh, let me explain the basics of the layout again as it relates to this exhibit. Um, the location of our property is on Chinpage Road and the unnamed right of way uh, to the left, west, and on the right is Crown Parkway. Um, the approved site plan features, we've highlighted the fence that, that we're discussing. The highlighted in yellow is approximately 466 feet of six foot height chain link security fence and pedestrian gates separating the internal employee parking area from the freight facility. And then in blue, we have approximately 5,726 linear feet of six foot height chain link security fence and gates with three strands of barbed wire at the top. And in green, um, within the right of way, approximately 2,405 linear feet of four foot high chain link security fence and gates with no barbed wire within 50 feet of the rights of way. The, the request in front of you today is to re revise the four foot security fence and gates with no barbed wire within 50 feet of the rights of way, the green part to a six foot tall um, chain link fence and gates with three strands of barbed wire consistent with the other approved perimeter fencing for the project, which is the blue. The proposed six foot fence with barbed wire will be an extension of the approved six foot fence with barbed wire. The purpose of the taller fence with barbed wire is to provide full security for the FedEx freight facility and the cargo within. Uh, the properties adjacent to the FedEx freight project are zoned IL or ILD and are industrial uses with the exception of a residential subdivision on the south side of Chinpage Road, which is zoned RSMD. Per the approved site plan for this subdivision, D0900025, a 25-foot tree replacement area is located between the Chinpage right-of-way and the closest, closest homes in this subdivision. As well, the approved site plan for FedEx freight requires buffers or VU plantings along both the Chinpage an unnamed road rights of way. And since the proposed six foot security fence and gates with barbed wire will not be any closer to the rights of way than the approved four foot fence, the expansion of the six foot security fence and gates with barbed wire will not be injurious to the value of the properties in the general vicinity. The pro proposed um, expansion of the fence will not adversely affect the health or safety of the public. The proposed fence height will have no impact on the site's lighting, utilities, open space, or environmental protection of stream buffers and tree coverage areas. And finally, to reiterate, the six foot security fence and gates with barbed wire will have minimal impact on surrounding properties. Uh, we appreciate your time this morning, and I ask that you vote in favor of the expansion of the six foot tall chain link fence and gates with three strands of barbed wire for the security of the FedEx freight facility. I'm available for any questions. Um, Tim Sivers is available for any questions. And as well, we have Mr. Jim Chandler of Chandler Property Group with us to make a brief presentation and he will also be available for any questions. All right, any question for Ms. Mitchell before we continue? All right, uh, and you said somebody, uh, Jim has a presentation? Yes. All right. We'll turn you don't need to be sworn in if he hasn't already. Hello, everyone. Mr. Chandler, uh, we're going to have to do the, the oath, and if you'll raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm that your testimony and evidence shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, please continue. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Jim Chandler. I am a broker in charge, owner, and principal of Chandler Property Group out of Apex, North Carolina. I do a lot of work all over the triangle. I've been asked to look at a, the, my professional opinion on the value if it affects the residential property and surrounding properties across the street. Um, 
I looked into the neighborhood of Sterling and saw, you know, looking at the site, you, you want to make sure, you know, with the six foot height proposed that it's not going to affect the value of the residential. And, you know, my, from my findings, you know, the, the homes that back up to Chin Page Road, um, which is directly across the street from the site, they have six foot wooden fences allowed. Most of the homes on the frontage already have them. Um, and they're wooden fences that you can't even see through. There's, and so beyond that, there's a 25 foot tree replacement area between the edge of the property and Chin Page Road. And on top of that, the frontage pads are five to 10 feet below the Chin Page Road grade. So it, on your first floor, if you're walking out, you're not really going to see anything. You probably can't even see Chin Page Road in most cases, but um, just picture walking out of your back door, your sliding glass door on those houses that back up the Chin Page and you will see, you, you'll see a buffered area. You'll come out of your back door. You'll have roughly 40 to 45 feet to the edge of your backyard and then you'll have a six foot privacy fence. And the whole time, the area kind of grades up towards the road. So adding to the, the lack of visibility to the street. Um, so beyond that, you know, you, you have the, the right away for Chin Page Road. And then you'll have obviously the, the whatever setback the fence is from the other side of the road. The visibility is very, very well, it's very well screened. It, the visibility is very low from the first floor. Um, I don't see any reason why it would affect the value or the price points on any of these neighborhoods. Most of those homes are pre-sales. They are all built out and they're actually building several more homes in the area behind them. So I'm available for any more questions you may have. Any questions for the witness? All right, um, Lynn or, or Tim, do you guys have anything else to add before? No. Okay. Uh, any questions from the board members uh, of the applicant? Mr. Right. Rich just has his hand raised. Hey, Mike. Um, hey, uh, good morning, all. Uh, is there, um, is there a, a, an issue with break-ins or security problem right now, or is this just trying to make everything consistent? And that's directed to uh, Mr. or Lynn. Lynn, you can, maybe you can answer that. It's to be consistent, but it is to provide security um, for the for the facility. It's consistent with, with the design of their freight facilities across the country. And, and be aware right now, Mr. Rochos, that um, as currently, um, it's, it's vacant, I believe. Um, and so there wouldn't be any break-ins until this is built. Nothing to break into, huh? <laughs> um, any other questions? All right, um, staff, do you have a recommendation for Cole? Yes, uh, yeah, one second. Staff recommends approval of case B2000015 so as long as the improvements shall be substantially consistent with the site plan, case D1900260 and all information submitted to the board as part of the application. All right. Uh, is there any any discussion on this case? Anybody would like to <clears throat> share any thoughts? All right. Would anybody like to make a motion? Meadows. Thank you. I hereby make a motion that application B2000015, an application for a minor special use permit on property located at 5203 and 5235, 
Chin Page Road has successfully met the applicable requirements of the Unified Development Ordinance and is hereby granted with the following conditions. The improvements shall be substantially consistent with the site plan, case D1900260, and all information submitted to the board as part of the application. We've got a motion. Is there a second? Lacey. All right, uh, we've got a motion and a second. Madam Clerk, will you call the board? Mr. Kip? Yes. Mr. De Ms. DeLacy? Yes. Ms. Wymore? Tisha, I think you were muted. Ms. Wymore? Still muted. Yes, hello. Thank you. Ms. Major? Yes. Mr. Meadows? Yes. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Mr. Regless? Yes. Motion carries seven to, seven to zero. All right, by a vote of seven to zero, your minor special use permit has been approved. Um, Thank you very much. Off. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, Madam Clark, you want to call the next uh, case? Case B2 A request for a variance for a re reduced street yard setback. The subject site is located at 1022 9th Street, is zoned residential urban, and is located in the Old West Neighborhood Protection Overlay. It's in the urban tier. This case has been advertised for the required period of time and property owners within 600 feet have been notified. Notarized affidavits verifying the sign postings and letter mailings are on file and the seating for uh, case B2000016 is Ms. DeLacy, Mr. Kip, Mr. Meadows, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Retchless, Ms. Major and Ms. Wymore. Right. Uh, before we continue, let's swear in the applicant and any anyone who wishes to speak. And I got to scroll through here to see who that may be. He's, all right. Do we have everybody? I think so. I think so. Okay. I'm just going to do it. Um, please raise your right hand. Um, do you solemnly swear or affirm that your testimony and evidence shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And oh, Jeff, you oh, hold on. Sorry, Jeff, you have been, you're muted um, as well as your video is off. Um, if you plan to speak, you'll have to swear in as well. Um, okay, yeah. I do. Can you hear Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going, Jeff, we'll need your, your video as well. <laughs> oh, shoot. Okay. When the time comes for you, to, there we go. Okay. I, my all my kids, none of my kids are here, so I can't get any help with this thing. Okay. Uh, and do you consent to this remote meeting platform? I do. I do. All righty. Thank you. Um, Cole, do you have this one? Yes. Um, Cole, I'm Cole Renegar again, uh, representing the planning department. Planning staff requests that the staff report and all materials submitted at the public hearing to be made part of the public record with any um, necessary corrections as noted, which I have a few. Um, okay. In the staff report, it currently says um, they're requesting a 6.5 foot variance on the street yard it is actually a 10 foot um, street yard variance. Um, I do have a, uh, a preview of the new survey at the end, that I'll show at the end of this presentation to show to reflect those changes um, from the one that's attached to your staff report. All right, so noted. Thank you. Case B twenty zero 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 one six um, is a request for a variance from the street yard setbacks for a new home. The applicant is Monsignor Investments LLC, and the subject uh, site is located at ten twenty two Ninth Street. The case area is highlighted in red. The site is in the urban tier, zoned residential urban five um, two and is within the city of Durham, Durham's jurisdiction. The site area is currently a single family residence, um, as you can see. Um, 
the applicant is requesting a reduction of the required street yard setback for a single family. Per section 7.1.2 of the UDO, the required rear yard setback is in the five, RU52 zone district is 20 feet. The applicant is proposing a 10 foot variance resulting in a 10 foot um, street yard. UDO section 3.1.4, sorry, 3.14.8 establishes that four findings the applicant must make in order for the board to grant a variance. These findings required approval are identified in the staff report and the applicant's response to the findings are identified in the application, both within your packet. And I'm <laughs> gonna bring up the, the new survey. Uh, I see that uh, Mr. Meadows has raised his hand. I, I don't want to interrupt you, Cole. I just wanted to uh, mention that uh, I'm a colleague of J.B. Culpepper's. Uh, she and I work together, uh, and I'm not involved in this case, but I wanted to just declare that, uh, that we are colleagues and have worked together on other projects. Thank you. <clears throat> Cole, do you have anything else? Uh, that is it. Okay, any questions for Cole before we hear from the applicant? So Lacey, right. I um, uh, you've, we see on the, on, the, on the screen here, you have a 25 by 25 site triangle. Is that um, what is required or is that what is going to be intruded upon? Because I see uh, a proposed new structure and then a long dotted structure around it. And I'm not really sure what the dotted structure is. I'm so, so you're, are you, is that a staff question or applicant question? Oh, it's, that's for you, baby. Um, it's the, the, the structure isn't gonna be um, imposing on that site triangle. That site triangle is something that is required on corner lots. Um, it won't be intruded on by the structure. Um, it does, uh, for the 10 foot variance is for the house, um, not necessarily the site triangle intrusion. Okay, and what does the large dotted line uh, represent? Do you know? So, yes, so um, as of right now, I believe, um, I th I actually, uh, Jeff, do you mind answering that question? Um, Sorry. well, I tell you the, the dotted line, cause this survey, I believe it's the setbacks. Yeah, that that's, we're just showing, showing the new setbacks there. Oh, uh, okay. So Thank that, you. that's it. All right. Uh, any other questions before staff, for staff? All right. Uh, what is Ms. Culpepper or Jeff, who's going to start? I'll, I'll start. So uh, with the existing uh, zoning, we have, they have a 20 foot setback on the Inglewood Avenue side of the property. And, you know, basically the house that's there now is, has significant foundation problems. And so I want, would like to rebuild, but if the setbacks stay as they are, I can only build like a house that's 20 feet wide. So that's why we're requesting the variance of a 10 foot additional 10 feet um and that's basically uh you know so i can build a new structure uh this is in the old west Durham neighborhood protection overlay so it will you know conform to the uh the 32 and a half percent uh uh ratio so uh it's not going to be a huge house basically the house the new structure will be approximately 2,250 uh, square feet. Um, but right now with the way the zoning is, and I'm not, and JB, maybe you can chime in on this. I don't know why it's so set so far back with the original 20 feet, but that's pretty much uh, what we're looking for is just a 10 foot variance on the Inglewood side. Everything else is remaining the same. JB Culpepper, um, 
I'm a consulting planner helping Jeff with the application materials and um, submitting it on the portal. And um, because we're at a corner lot here at 9th Street in Inglewood, the um, UDO imposes a street setback on both streets. And um, you'll notice along Inglewood, especially in the aerial that was provided by Cole, thank you, Cole, that most of the structures along Inglewood um, for that, what's in effect a side yard, um, don't meet that um, 20 foot street setback. So it's to be more in keeping with what's in the area and to allow a normal width house to be constructed. Thank you. And I'll turn it back over to Jeff so he can address the four findings. And um, Mr. Chair, could we request that our materials, including the, um, up, the updated plot plan be put in the record? Yeah, I was just about to ask you about your testimony. So thank uh, you for noting that. Um, I believe Meadows has a question. Mr. Meadows. Do it's it's for anyone who cares to answer. There's an existing structure on the site right now. Um, how close is that structure to the Inglewood Avenue right of way? I believe and this is JB Culpepper. I believe Cole in the packet, maybe with the aerial view that um, Mr. Meadows may be able to to see. It is closer than ten feet <laughs> now. Um, okay. Can you scroll through the uh, packet materials? I'm trying to see. It's the Are one you, with the aerial. You may be able to see. Through. The aerial was included in the presentation. Yes. Not, okay. Correct. I don't think it has a distance on there, um, but I. Yeah, can... I don't think it has a distance, but I think Chad, Chad will get a feel for. It. So can, you can see the structure protruding out and um, it's not as clear as I thought yeah, right. but you can if you look if you stare at it for a while you can see the um, existing structure and it appears to be basically at the at the right of way and you'll also notice that the structures across the street and along that segment of Inglewood that the structures are pretty much up very close to the sidewalk. Are you able to see that? I'm going to bring up a new aerial that um, does not have the uh, red Overlay. over it. Thank yes. you, Cole. So one second. Appreciate you, that. You've been to the site, is that correct? Me, JB, yes. yes. You've been there, yes? Correct. OK, thank you. While Cole is doing that, does anyone have any other questions? I think, well, first, uh, Jeff, you had some more testimony to give about. Well, I was just going to basically, um, you know, go through the uh, the four questions if if I need to do that. Uh, if, you know, but basically, uh, unnecessary hardship would result uh, in a strip, strict application of the ordinance. It shall not be necessary to demonstrate that in the absence of the variance, no reasonable uh, use can be made of the property. So basically, if I don't get the variance, you know, it's pretty much, it's an unbuildable lot. I can't build a house 20 feet wide. Um, and the hardship results in conditions that are peculiar, peculiar to the property, such as the location size, topo, hardships resulting from personal circumstances, as well as hardships resulting from conditions that are common to the neighborhood or the general public may not be a basis for granting a uh, variance. So basically, um, uh, you know, it's again, you know, not, not buildable. Um, and of course I haven't done anything to the property to, you know, cause this issue uh, when I bought the property a number of years ago, uh, that's the way it was. So go ahead, I'll just go ahead and let you look at this next uh, visual. I'm, I'm sorry, Chad, was your, is your hand raised for another question or? Did you forget to learn? No, I no, sir. It's not. I'm 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 good. Thank you. Okay. Where do we look? Oh yeah, ten twenty-two. Okay. Um, 
And Jeff, it sounded like you were done. Yes, I'm done. I'm good. Yeah. Any questions for uh, the applicant? Uh, I see that Wymore has um, raised her hand. Ms. Wymore. Hi, yes. Um, I do have a question for the applicant. It, from what we can see here, you also own the property next door at 1020, I believe it is. Yes, ma'am. I own um, the 1020 next door and I also own, well, you didn't ask, but I also own 1100 Ninth Street as well. With, I guess with regard to the one next door, because I, I don't see if it's a new house or it's existing or what your plan is for it. I just wanted to know um, what's there or what's being proposed there. Sure, uh, on, on the, uh, so basically the existing house there is, is old, like the old, a lot of the old mill houses. And I'm actually gonna try to build a duplex with a new, uh, something that blends into the neighborhood the 1020 is also a new house as well. It's been there a number of years, but I want to do a duplex, uh, you know, and obviously that would uh, in the neighborhood protection overlay. So, but something in keeping with the neighborhood like I've done with the other houses I own on 9th Street as well. All right, any other questions for the applicant? All right, uh, any thoughts on this case? Whoa, I think my chair just broke. <laughs> Sorry. All right, uh, well, this is a variance. Um, does anybody want to make a motion? <clears throat> Meadows. I hereby make a motion that application number B200016, an application for a request for a six and a half foot variance resulting in a 13 and a half foot. No, Chad, uh, it's actually a 10 foot variance. I'm reading off the motion, sorry. Uh, yeah. I revised that to a 10 foot variance resulting in a 10 foot street yard on property located at 1022 Ninth Street has successfully met the applicable requirements of the Unified Development Ordinance and is hereby granted with the following conditions. The improvements shall be substantially consistent with the plans and all information submitted to the board as part of the application. We have a motion. Is there a second? One more second. That's one more. All right. Uh, Susan, will you call the board? Yes. Ms. Lacey? Yes. Ms. Wamore? Yes. Mr. Kip? Yes. Ms. Major? Yes. Mr. Meadows? Yes. Mr. Retchless? Yes. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Motion carries seven to zero. By a vote of seven to zero, your variant uh, has been approved. You'll get an order shortly in, uh, from planning, and we appreciate your time this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, Susan, would you like to call the next and final case? Yes. B2000017, a request for a minor special use permit to allow for a six foot tall fence in the street frontage of the subject property the site is located at 110 East Markham Avenue is zoned residential urban and it is in the falls of the new Jordan Lake protected area watershed protection overlay and in the urban tier. This case has been advertised for the required period of time property owners within 600 feet have been notified notarized affidavits verifying the sign postings and letter mailings are on file and the seating for case B2000017 is Miss Wymore, Mr. Retchless, Miss Major, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Meadows, Mr. Kip, and Miss DeLacy.
Sorry, thank you. Uh, I think we need, now we need to administer the oath. Is the applicant on video here? May you need to speak up. <laughs> okay. can, can you hear me? Yes, yes. All right, uh, if you will raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm that your testimony and evidence shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, and do you uh, consent to, um, to this remote meeting platform? Yes. Thank you. All right, and who, I'm not sure which, Cole, do you have this one? Yes, it is me. Turn it over to you. Okay. Um, good morning. I'm Cole Reniger again, representing the planning department. Planning staff requests that the staff report and all materials submitted at the public hearing to be made part of the public record with any necessary corrections as noted. So noted. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the applicant and owner is um, Dewitt Russell. Um, he's requesting a six foot tall privacy fence in the 50 foot street frontage off North, Bo North Roxborough Street. The case area is highlighted in red. The site is in the urban tier, zoned residential urban, RUM, as in the city of um, Durham's jurisdiction. The site area is currently an existing multi-family residential. Um, a fence greater than four heat and height located between the structure and the street, except as exempt by the Unified Development Ordinance, UDO section 9.9.1B, requires approval through MSU P by the Board of Adjustment, pursuant to section 9.9.1, fences and walls height. This minor special use permit request is to allow fence located in the street frontage of the lots um, <clears throat> off Roxborough Road to be taller than four feet. The applicant is requesting a six foot high privacy fence. UDO section 3.98A and B establish four findings and 13 review factors the applicant must meet in order for the board to grant a use permit these findings and review factors are identified in the staff report and the applicant's responses to the findings and review factors are identified in the application, both with your packet. All right, any uh, questions for Cole before we hear from the applicant? I, I do, yeah. I have a couple. Mr. Meadows. Uh, good morning, Cole. Uh, morning. This is Meadows, uh, thank you. Um, you said this is a multifamily use. How many uh, units are in, in this building and how many uh, off-street parking spaces are required? So um, they're in the urban tier. So I don't, I don't think they're, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure about the parking requirements. I'll check. But as far as how many people are residents, I'll let Mr. Russell answer that question. How, how, not how many residents, how many units? I'll let, again, I'll let Mr. Russell answer. Okay, thank question. you. Yes, six units. Thank you. Any other questions for Cole before we move on? All right, uh, Mr. Russell, would you like to say a few words? Well, yeah, I would hope that you guys um, understand the reason why the fence is needed, but unfortunately, um, I had a had a an occurrence on the property on the 19th of April where a $5,000 motorcycle of one of my tenants was stolen uh, from the property. I also have five um, heating and air units at the rear of the property and the reason for the fencing is an attempt um, to keep prying eyes off my tenant's property and my property and for their safety and, and the protection of my property. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Russell? I can't see. Cole, you're going to have to help me out if there's any hands raised. Kip, I have a question. Yes, Mr. he Kip. just raised his hand. And then Michael after him. Okay, so um, I, you know, I live around the corner. Um, I know Mr. Russell. How are you, sir? Um, of course, I have no or a relationship with the property. But my question is, 
Um, does the fence really need to be six feet all the way to the front? Wouldn't just fence six feet in the back be sufficient? So just to clarify. This is only, this, this is only in the rear of the property. It's only in the rear. Right. That's, that's correct. Okay. Um, so I was just, yeah. feet is from the back of the house to the back. Yeah, if you if you look at the last thing, um, he has that sixty foot fence um, where he's on planning on placing it in the um, <clears throat> presentation that's showing um, where that line starts is the back of the house is very faint, um, as you can see, um, and that's where he's only putting to put the fence. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Richels, and then Mr. Lacey. Yeah, hi, Mr. Russell. This is Mike Richels. Uh, what type of fence are you constructing? Or are you wanting to construct there? The wooden fence. Uh, what, like a stockade where you can't see, just you just kind of block in the view. Correct. Yes. And is there a, uh, is there an entrance to the back of that property where you're putting that fence up? Yes, there is. So you're showing from the corner of the lot, the, 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 the southeast corner, um, going toward the building, where are the vehicles coming through? Is there going to be a gate there or? Can you Correct, give me, yes. Can you give me a little more detail of, of exactly what you're trying to do? Well, again, like I said, the main purpose is for the security of uh, the tenants, the Hickles. Um, my my uh, property that's at the rear of the building. Um, there is a an opening at the end of the property that um, the Hickles and tenants would be able to egress and and get into the property from. So, uh, I, I, from the top of goal. Uh, topographical map here. I'm seeing maybe two entrances, one at the southeast and one up near the building. Is that still current? That is current, yes. So you're trying to put a fence from both egress points in between there? Is that what you're looking to do? Correct, yes. So uh, my question is, will there be a gate for that egress point? Yes, and there is a basement. The first one, the one closest to the to the property, to the building itself, that's an access. If you go into that opening there, that leads to the basement of the building. I have I have supplies and and uh, I have stoves, refrigerators, air conditioning units, and other um, things relating to my businesses stored in that uh, basement area. I think what I'm trying to get to is if, if you're going to put a gate, um, what kind of detail can you provide of how that gate is going to swing inward or outward? Um, They're going to be sliding, sliding gates, sliding in, in the gates are going to be on the inside and they would slide back and forth. Okay. Parallel with North Roxborough street. Correct. Yes. Uh, do you have any kind of um, detail drawn up on how that's going to look? No, sir. Okay, thank you. No more questions. Cole, did you say somebody else? I could. Um, I believe um, before I, uh, I think it was, I think there was one other person, um, DeLacy, but before I go on, it looks maybe Meadows as well. Um, if there is a gate, um, they, they will need to provide, um, stacking, um, that just be, needs to be noted. Um, I would like to mention though, that, a that a six foot fence, um, tomorrow will actually be allowed by right in this area. Um, the stacking will have to be provided though. So even, so just to let you guys know, um, regardless of what the board says tomorrow, um, the UDO changes to allow six foot foot in residential areas with corner lots. So just to let you guys know. 
All right. Any other questions? Delacy, my question was already answered. I just wanted to know what the material was going to be. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any others? Cole, would you like to make a recommendation? Um, yes, one moment. Um, staff recommends approval of case B 200017 um, as long as the improvements um, are consistent with the information shown and I believe if the stacking is addressed. All right, uh, any discussion of board, uh, from board members? Mr. Lacey? Mr. Lacey. Uh, I have a question for Cole. Mm -hmm. uh, should we approve this today? Uh, would stacking not be an issue if there were to be a gate? Cole? Sorry. Um, <laughs> Sorry, dude. <laughs> Uh, gates gates were um, originally discussed. Um, but my question is: right today, stacking isn't required or is required. Tomorrow, Stack stacking will be required. Yes, S stacking is required. That's not something that the changes in the UDO. Okay. Um, I think you may be able to add it as a condition, um, but that's up to you whether the board either wants to do a continuance or add it as a condition. Um, but I'll leave that up to you. Would How would that stacking be? Would he have to widen the road or would he have to have it one car, the door, the uh, fence be, or the gate be a car length in? What are you describing? Okay, hold on one second. Oh. <clears throat> This is Jessica Dockery, Planning Department. Per UDO 10.5.1, with an unstaffed gate, there should be minimum parking spaces, uh, stacking spaces, two on either side of the gate. So the fence should be set back enough to allow that amount of parking. So you're talking about 20 feet? That yeah, it destroys but backyard. That correct. So that actually should be a variance. If a gate is proposed and there isn't sufficient space, then that is something you should take into consideration. The uh, the current uh, request is only for the fence. It doesn't include the gate. It does appear that way. Uh, that's actually something I was going to mention. Yeah, I, we're, we're talking about a fence here while it does sound like it would be a, a variant. So, um, and there's also, it sounds like there's enforcement for something like that if it was to be built. So, um, any other thoughts? Uh, Chad? I, 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 I think that we've got uh, an application that calls for uh, the placement of a fence. Um, it's not dimensioned. It's not clear where it sits in relation to the lot line. It's not clear that there's one or two gates. Um, it's not clear how stacking would be accommodated. Um, aside from all of that, tomorrow, he wouldn't have to submit this for, for this special use permit uh, application. So. I, I just, I have to wonder, you know, we've got an application here that I'm not sure is complete uh, for an activity that tomorrow he's not going to need our permission on. Um, I, I guess my question is, why are we doing this? At the, at the time this was submitted, um, the UDO had not um, been proposed to be changed. Uh -huh. um, so we're still allowed to hold this. Um, we still have to hold this case until the UDO does change to be effective which is tomorrow, but at the time this was advertised and submitted, um, 
none of this was allowed at that time. Um, and the UDR had, had not been proposed to be changed. Um, it has changed now. Um, since it's advertised, we do have to hold it um, because that's what's advertised. Um, and since technically it's not allowed yet, it still is still valid until tomorrow. Could, could, could the applicant request a continuance of this? Um, the applicant, uh, well, the applicant can't, I mean, if he'd like to do a continuance and that's something the board thinks is viable, they can mention that, but it would be the, it would be the board that has to say continuance. The applicant could suggest it, but the board would have to well, motion yeah. and approve that. Okay. Well, would this whole process be irrelevant tomorrow? Is that, is that the point? Um, the fence height would be, however, the stacking um, will, will, will be relevant, but that may be a different application, I believe. This is Here. just about the planning department. The gate may not have come up as part of the first application. Now that we know that there is a gate proposed, that would need to be another application. And it has nothing to do with what we're talking about right now. With, that with is the correct. Fence. So the application is to back to, while the gate is a conversation, I think that's a separate item. Right now, that is, what's before us is a six foot tall fence in the street frontage. Correct. Chair, I'd wanted to add, um, this is Krista Kukro, city attorney's office. Um, if the case is continued, I, I don't know what the will of the board is at this point. Um, that continuance would be under the old provisions of the UDO, so that would still be what the board has to consider. Most certainly, the new provisions of the UDO could be persuasive to the board, um, but I just wanted to point that out for your consideration on the fence height issue. Well, one question I have, what if, what if this is denied today? So tomorrow, would that order, uh, what would that look like given the new rules tomorrow? Uh, he would be allowed by right, regardless of the board's decision. Exactly. So let's let's go ahead and, and move and do something. So does anybody want to make a motion? This is Jessica Dockery, Planning Department. Are you going to address the required variance for the gate in your motion? I don't. I would don't see why. I hesitate to just give a blanket approval or denial of the fence height because tomorrow the height goes, that issue goes away without at least acknowledging that the fence can't be constructed without the gate. Just my opinion. Krista Kukro, City Attorney's Office. Um, I think a condition that would be on the approval, if that's the direction the board goes, is that it has to comply with other UDO provisions. And I'm just wondering, maybe it would be helpful for the board to understand and the applicant to understand um, what else would be required following today's meeting. How would that get caught as far as the gate and the stacking requirement? Because I, th I would assume that there's, there is a way that it would get caught and therefore I don't think we need the condition but it might be helpful for everyone to hear about that. Jessica Dockery, Planning Department. As a single family home that or a duplex, this would just be caught through the building permit process. Uh, multifamily may also just need to go to a building permit process because it's simply a fence. That is a quicker review than a site plan review. One would hope that it's caught at that point, but sometimes the BOA actions and orders cloud those reviews somewhat, and they're expecting the words that you say to somewhat guide their review, if that makes sense. And if, if it wasn't caught um, somehow, uh, it would be probably addressed as an enforcement issue after the fact. I'm, I'm having a hard time why, why we're spending a lot of time on a gate when it's not included in what we're looking for. I know he mentioned a gate, but he could also say, you know what, I'm not going to do a gate. And it could just be a fence. 
Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Um, I, so I for, forgive my lack of knowledge on the parking requirements in the urban tier. Uh, it's why I posed the question in the first place. There's parking in the front yard. There's also parking in the rear yard. Um, I think the issue at hand here is that the fence as drawn isn't allowable under the regulation because the stacking requirements would mandate that it be 20 feet away from the right of way. So the applicant has a fence application in front of you that won't work if it has gates. Um, I think that's where we are. Um, I'm with you in that I'm not comfortable proposing conditions for gates when it doesn't have anything to do with the minor special use permit that's in front of us. Um, but there definitely seems to be some more unwinding that should be done here. Uh, because I think if, if the applicant does want gates and he wants the fence in the location that he's drawn it, he's gonna be back in front of us with a variance request. Uh, agreed, I, I agree with that. I, I think that, uh, and also if we continue this, it's kind of strange that it would be under the old codes provisions instead of what would go into effect tomorrow. Did I understand you right, Krista? It's fascinating. Yes, that's correct. So oh. even though, all right. So Lacey, so if we vote no, it does, it's immaterial tomorrow. Yes? As for a fence. For a fence. And if we say specifically in the motion that it be a wooden solid fence with no gates, that way he could put up a fence to, you know, tomorrow or today. Um, uh, but we would not be unduly um, influencing uh, people in the next approval process to the uh, building permit process uh, to, to, for them to say, oh, well, they said that gate was all right. I, I'm, I'm also assuming that he could withdraw. Right, correct. He could he could withdraw. Um, hey. But then, um, well, again, would, would I would I get would I get my money back for the application fee? Unfortunately, not um, because it did go through review and it was advertised, which is um, what the charge is for. Um, and that's also why I didn't feel like it was um, worth mentioning because the money would not be returned because you've already been notified, so the notification surcharge has okay. been charged. And okay, I have submitted I have submitted, submitted numerous photos to you showing similar properties throughout the city. Um, they, gates, they, they only fences. Are, sorry, they're only going to be applicable if they're um, in close proximity to the property that has been requested. Um, if they're just throughout the city, only the ones that are close are the ones that can be can be held as testimony. So this property, my property, was singled out for a specific reason for this enforcement? No, not necessarily. Um, those other properties, they may have had a fence before um, the ordinance came into, uh, into effect, or it could be um, that they have enforcement cases as well. I just can't answer to that, that question. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll make you aware a lot of them appear to have been done within the last year. Right. So okay. they may, so they may have enforcement cases. Um, but if that is, if not the case and you'd like to, you know, submit them as an enforcement case, you're welcome to do so. Um, but that is not what this meeting. It, that, that Cole, Cole, that's not, that's not my job. Okay. That's not my job. I mean, right. like I and said, I I'm asking you, I'm asking you, if my property has been singled out for this enforcement, sir, I can't. I can't answer that question because I'm not enforcement. Um, to talk to them, you'd have to directly I, contact them to ask that question. I think we also need to talk about enforcement. This board doesn't enforce, and that's something that that I've, I've said before is that there's that's, that's out of our realm. Uh, so even if for some reason he puts a gate without a variance, I, I, frankly, that. Are, I mean, are, are one of you going to go tear it down? No, uh, that's, that's there's an enforcement that, that goes into that. So I really think we've got to get back to where we are, right to the to what we've got before us. I, I would like to just continue to, Miss Russell, if you would like to talk to the enforcement people 
to find out that information. It is all public record and it can be requested, but you would have to go um, through them, not through me. All right. Mr. May I say something, Kip? Yes. Sir. I want to commend Mr. Russell for cleaning up the property that's been an eyesore for years, cleaning up the front, cleaning up the back. Uh, this is moving in the right direction. So, you know, I, I'm not calling for a motion to approve this yet, but I just want to say he's, he's doing what a property owner should do, which is upkeep the property, make it look nicer. I imagine the tenancy is improved. It, the, the property looks a hundred times better than it has for many years. I agree. Well, thanks Ian, that property, that property was built in 1925. It's almost a hundred years old. Okay, I purchased that property in 2005 for $180,000. That property was appraised several months ago for $650,000, okay? So uh, to, to have to contend with, with, with the nitpicking of a fence um, that's in keeping with other um, properties in the community. I mean, this is, this is, this is, this is very odd to me. I share your sentiments, sir. Um, all right. Thoughts in what we'll entertain a motion. There has to be some kind of motion made. We can make a motion and then vote against it, yes? Or we can make the motion different from the one that appears in our packets, yes? Uh, yeah, you, I guess you can make a motion yes, to the Because you have to make, all motions must be made in the positive rather than you can't make a motion to deny. You have to make a motion in favor of and then you can all vote against it or for it. Is that correct, Counselor? That's correct. Thank you. DeLacy, I make a motion. Uh, uh, I hereby make a motion that application number B2000017 an application for a minor special use permit on property located at 110 East Markham Street has successfully met the applicable requirements of the Unified Development Ordinance and is hereby granted with the following conditions. Uh, that the fence be made of solid wood uh, and that there is no approval implied for a gate. Uh, and that the improvements shall be substantially consistent with the site plan and all information sub, sub, submitted to the board for the application. How's that? Specifically, they didn't ask for gate. We're saying no gate. Feel free, I would accept a, 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 a friendly amendment. It Mr. Wardell. If, if I may suggest, uh, the evidence presented is that there's an intention to have a gate. So I think it would be appropriate to address the gate in terms of a condition on the approval. And that would have to be agreed to and consented to by Mr. Russell. If Mr. Russell does not want to consent to that condition, then he can say no, and then you can vote. But if he is willing to say, yes, I'm, I'm going to consent to the conditions that are associated with a gate, then you can place that on the approval as a condition. So it would be appropriate to say that, that if there is a gate, then it would go through a process of a variance as it what, whatever what, it, it would have to comply with whatever the UDO requirements are for right. but Mr. Russell would have to consent to that as a condition 
to this approval. If not, you just vote on the fence. Which is what's before us. Well, what's before you is what the evidence is. And the evidence is that he says he intends to have a gate. And the evidence is also that he submitted just for a fence, not for a wooden fence. Uh, and I, uh, I, he announced that he wanted a wooden fence. Um, a chain link fence would be a totally different matter in this neighborhood. So I see off. So I would, I would just ask the applicant, is, is he willing to consent to comply with the UDO requirements for a gate? Mr. Russell, are you willing what to- are those, what, what, what are those requirements? So those requirements that the gate would have to be um, placed 50 feet, um, 50 feet in from the street yard. Um, That's the Dockery Planning Department, 40 feet. 40 like feet, two sorry. Cars. And, it, and it would not be the whole fence. It sure. would just be the part of the gate where the cars are accessing. Yeah, that'll, that'll defeat the purpose of having a fence in place. And that that's why they mentioned the variance, um, Mr. Russell, is that you could apply for a variance to lessen that amount of footage inward. Well, that 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 should have all been included in 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 this matter right now that we're dealing with. Okay, I mean, when the when the violation at at the time of was noted. Staff would like to point it at the time of submittal, um, a gate was not mentioned that was going to be a part of this fence. Um, I would like to make the, the board aware that we were unaware of the gate. It was not part of the application submitted. Um, therefore, we did not include it in the application. Okay. Well, again, who, whoever the enforcement person was that reported this, when they were on site, they should have been able to see the exact dimensions and the layout um of this fence and what it was made of and and how it was operational um that was all in place prior to 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 the city coming out and and you know um deciding to enforce this rule this well, fence already existed the gates already existed prior to them um going forward with this enforcement These things were known. The, 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 the gate was always there. This is this is a known fact. Okay, you can look at the pictures that the enforcement person took, and you will see. All right. Well, we've got a motion by Miss Delacy. She's open to amendments. If you would like to make one, do we need to reread the motion? But at this point, yes. How about it? You're, You're muted, Ms. Delacy. Regina. Oops, sorry. How about it, Susan? Do <laughs> you want to uh, read the motion, or do I have to construct it again out of whole cloth? My notes were to approve um, the fence needed to be solid wood, no approval for the gate. In essence, yes. All right, so yeah. we've got a motion. May, may, may I just say something? I'm, I'm not sure I'm making an amendment to the motion, but before us is a fence. I'm not prepared to talk about a gate. Are we prepared to rule on a gate that we don't know about? So I, my, my inkling would be to approve Mr. Russell's application and the future will hold what the future holds. Does that make sense? Yes. So with Ms. DeLacy's motion, I uh, fell for a lack of a second, no, and then we go uh, with Kip's not, motion? Not yet. He didn't make a motion. Uh, he was just making a comment. Uh, Jessica, do you have something, Major? Yes, um, Jessica Major. I'm unclear. Is this gate, I mean, I'm sorry, is this fence already there? And we're saying yes, yes. it's okay? Yeah, that's true. Okay. 
I, I'm sorry, this is Chad. Can I get that one more time? There is a fence in place and there is a gate in place. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Correct. So this is this is this exists now and this is an after the fact. Okay. Which we've had multiple times. This is sure. this isn't new. All right. Uh Ian, I agree with you. Uh, any other thoughts, amendments, or a second to Mr. Lacey's motion? Chair, I have a clarification, um, and this is really a question for Susan, I think. So uh, just because I do want to be very clear about what we're voting on here. So we're voting on an approval with a condition that the fence be made of solid wood, a condition that there's no implied imp approval of a gate. And I believe when Mr. Lacey made her original motion she also mentioned a condition that the fence comply with provisions of the udo susan can you confirm that or miss delacy can you confirm that i didn't mention the udo but uh i mentioned the uh um substantially consistent with uh what was presented okay, uh, okay. i could change it to the udo the udo is the udo it's yeah, I mean, that's what we're dealing with. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is there a second or is there an amendment? I'm willing to make a second. This is Meadows. I want to understand. The motion is for approval, provided the fence is wood, and provided there is uh, that this approval does not authorize the inclusion of a gate in that fence. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes. Counselor, am I understanding that correctly? Yes. <laughs> I second the motion. All right, we've got a motion and a second. I plan to vote no on this be, uh, solely because I don't believe uh, uh, the gate ought to be included. Otherwise, I'd be voting for the approval. I'm sorry, what'd you say? To I, plan on, Roger? I plan on voting no on this be solely because of the gate clause. What, how would you change it? I'd eliminate it. Truth be told, the gate the gate is wood. Or excuse me, the fence is wood. Um, so I'm comfortable with the, the motion. I, I'm, I'm, I don't think, anyway, I'm not gonna vote no. But, but the fence is gate, the, the gate is wood. So that, I'm comfortable with that being the motion. Yeah, I don't have a problem with the wood. I mean, he says it's going to be wood. Sounds like it already is wood. <laughs> All right, uh, Susan. This yeah, it blends. It blends the, the gate. The gate blends in with the fence. I mean, it's 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 just an opening. It, it's an opening um, that slides back and forth, and once it's closed, it looks like a solid fence. Okay. Well, okay, yeah, well. uh, roll call. Uh, Mr. Rogers. I knew you were going to call me first. I knew. <laughs> you just have to pay attention to the order of seating, dude. I uh, know. Well, I try to mix it up. You do always. Um, yes. Mr. Kip. Yes. Ms. Wymore? Yes. Ms. Major? No. Mr. Retchless? No. Mr. Meadows? Yes. Ms. DeLacy? Yes. Motion carried. Six to one. No. No. Uh, motion failed. Six no. to one. No. Motion carries five to two. I'm sorry. Who I had Miss Major voted no. Who else voted no? Wretchless. Wretchless. Sorry. I did not hear that. I will buy a vote of five to two. Your uh, request for a minor special use permit has been approved for your fence. Thank you all very much. Have a good day, sir. All right. You too. Thanks. Let's uh, moving on. Any old business? 
any new business that anybody wants to bring up, I've got a couple of things. All right, one thing. Okay. Um, Mr. Frederick Davis has uh, resigned from the board, I guess effectively yesterday. And uh, Chris Burnham did not renew her, her term. So there's two openings, or will be um, now. And I guess what that means is, is for the alternates, and I know that Frederick is county, I believe Chris is county as well, that the two county alternates will, will move up. That's generally how it is. Um, as, as full members. Yep. And, all right. So anybody else have any new business? Anything to discuss before we go to approval of orders? Okay. All right. We're going to be, we've got continued from uh, June 23rd meeting a case in every, each one of these has to have a motion and a second and everyone vote. Uh, case number B2000003. I think that, that might like be a typo. Okay, is it a typo? I'm throwing it, it is out. A, it is a typo, so we can go straight to the 10. All right. I need a motion for B2000010. The Lacey, so move. Is there a second? Meadow, second. And Susan, do you need to go right through every one of us? Call? We can't just do a nice. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, give me just a second here. Okay. So to approve the order B2000010, Ms. DeLacy? Yes. Mr. Kip? Yes. Mr. Meadows? Yes. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Mr. Redless? Yes. Ms. Major? Yes. Ms. Wymore? Yes. All right, uh, approved. Uh, B2000011. Meadows, move approval. Is there a second? Ratchless. All right. Susan? Ms. DeLacy? Yes. Mr. Kip? Yes. Mr. Meadows? Yes. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Mr. Ratchless? Yes. Ms. Major? Yes. Ms. Wymore? Yes. All right, B2000013. I can move Ratchless. All right, Ratchless, is there a second? Lacey. Lacey. Uh -oh. Okay, Ms. Wymore? Yes. Ms. Major? Yes. Mr. Retchless? Yeah. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Mr. Meadows? Yes. Mr. Kip? Yes. Ms. DeLacy? Yes. You got me already. Good. I'm sorry. Yep. Well, I'm happy to vote twice, but you know, <laughs> somebody's going to demand a ballot boxing recount. And I, I will mention on the next motion, uh, Meadows did vote no. And he cannot vote on this one. So B2000014. DeLacy, so move. Is there a second? One more second. One more. All right. Uh, <laughs> You'll get the next okay. one, Mikey. <laughs> uh, Ms. DeLacy? Yes. Mr. Kip? Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, Mr. Meadows? He can't. I don't can't get play. to play. I on shouldn't this. even call it. He can't call. He can't play with this one. Okay. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Mr. Ratchless? Yes. Ms. Major? Yes. Ms. Wymore? Yes. So six to zero. Yeah. B2000015. Meadows, move approval. Thank you. Is there a second? Kip, right. second. Yeah. Yeah. Kip got it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Stay off Ms. mute, Wymore? dude. <laughs> yes. Ms. Major? Yes. Mr. Retchless? Yes. Mr. Rogers? Yes. Mr. Meadows? Yes. I Mr. think Kip? I moved it. Yes. Ms. DeLacy? Yes. Seven to zero. All righty. 
Uh, the final one, uh, B2000016. Five people can vote only. No, this is the. Uh, this was seven. Oh, one six, I'm sorry. I, I lost count. And we do have one after this, 17. The 17. Agreed, but I don't think we're going to be voting on it today, right? Yeah, right. Right. Okay, so 16. Who wants it? Mike? So move. Ha <laughs> ha! He's got the second. Meadows second. Thank you. Susan? Yeah, okay. Okay, Miss Major. Yes. Miss Wymore. Yes. Mr. Retchless. Yes. Mr. Rogers. Yes. Mr. Meadows. Yes. Mr. Kip. Yes. Miss DeLacy. Yes. Seven to zero. All righty. We move that. The next one will be at the next meeting, which is set for July 28th at 8.30 for next meeting. Um, and now there's a motion for adjournment. Uh, at location of the next meeting, Mr. Chair? I'm thinking virtual. We will be huh? virtual until given permission otherwise from Board of County Commissioners and City Council. The City Hall is still closed, so we will be virtual for the July and probably August. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I make a motion to adjourn. Anybody want to second this one? Yes. <laughs> yes. You can all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you for your time, guys. I'll talk. See you uh, next month. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you.